The Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, Part 2, AD 1015-1154 Published in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, 1912 Translated by Rev. James Ingram Digitalized by Douglas B. Killings Audiobook produced by Open Audio Recordings and read by Nancy, a Microsoft Azure AI Neural Voice. Start of Part 2 AD 1015 This year was the Great Council at Oxford, where Alderman Edric betrayed Sigfirth and Morcar, the eldest thanes belonging to the Seven Towns. He allured them into his bower, where they were shamefully slain. Then the king took all their possessions and ordered the widow of Sigfirth to be secured and brought within Malmesbury. After a little interval, Edmund Etheling went and seized her, against the king's will, and had her to wife. Then, before the nativity of St. Mary, went the Etheling west north into the five towns and soon plundered all the property of Sigfirth and Morcar, and all the people submitted to him. At the same time came King Newt to Sandwich, and went soon all about Kent into Wessex, until he came to the mouth of the Frome, and then plundered in Dorset, and in Wiltshire, and in Somerset. King Ethelred, meanwhile, lay sick at Corsham, and Alderman Edric collected an army there, and Edmund the Etheling in the north. When they came together, the Alderman designed to betray Edmund the Etheling, but he could not, whereupon they separated without an engagement, and sheared off from their enemies. Alderman Edric then seduced forty ships from the king and submitted to Newt. The West Saxons also submitted and gave hostages and horsed the army. And he continued there until midwinter. AD 1016 This year came King Newt with a marine force of 160 ships and Alderman Edric with him over the Thames into Mercia at Cricklade whence they proceeded to Warwickshire during the middle of the winter and plundered therein and burned and slew all they met. Then began Edmund the Etheling to gather an army, which, when it was collected, could avail him nothing, unless the king were there and they had the assistance of the citizens of London. The expedition therefore was frustrated, and each man betook himself home. After this, an army was again ordered, under full penalties, that every person, however distant, should go forth, and they sent to the king in London, and besought him to come to meet the army with the aid that he could collect. When they were all assembled, it succeeded nothing better than it often did before, and, when it was told the king, that those persons would betray him who ought to assist him, then forsook he the army, and returned again to London. Then rode Edmund the Etheling to Earl Uterd in Northumbria, and every man supposed that they would collect an army King Newt, but they went into Staffordshire, and to Shrewsbury, and to Chester, and they plundered on their parts, and Newt on his. He went out through Buckinghamshire to Bedfordshire, thence to Huntingdonshire, and so into Northamptonshire along the Fens to Stamford. Thence into Lincolnshire. Thence to Nottinghamshire, and so into Northumbria toward York. When Uterd understood this, he ceased from plundering, and hastened northward, and submitted for need, and all the Northumbrians with him, but, though he gave hostages, he was nevertheless slain by the advice of Alderman Edric and Thurkital, the son of Nafon, with him. After this, King Newt appointed Eric Earl over Northumbria, as Uterd was, and then went southward another way, all by west, till the whole army came, before Easter, to the ships. Meantime Edmund Etheling went to London to his father, and after Easter went King Newt with all his ships toward London, but it happened that King Ethelred died ere the ships came. He ended his days on St. George's Day, having held his kingdom in much tribulation and difficulty as long as his life continued. After his decease, all the peers that were in London, and the citizens, chose Edmund King, who bravely defended his kingdom while his time was. Then came the ships to Greenwich, about the gang days, and within a short interval went to London, where they sunk a deep ditch on the south side, and dragged their ships to the west side of the bridge. Afterwards they trenched the city without, so that no man could go in or out, and often fought against it, but the citizens bravely withstood them. King Edmund had ere this gone out, and invaded the West Saxons, who all submitted to him, and soon afterward he fought with the enemy at Penn near Gillingham. A second battle he fought, after midsummer, at Sherston, where much slaughter was made on either side, and the leaders themselves came together in the fight. Alderman Edric and Aylmer the Darling were assisting the army against King Edmund. Then collected he his force the third time, and went to London, all by north of the Thames, and so out through Clayhanger, and relieved the citizens, driving the enemy to their ships. 
It was within two nights after that the king went over at Brentford, where he fought with the enemy, and put them to flight, but there many of the English were drowned, from their own carelessness, who went before the main army with a design to plunder. After this, the king went into Essex, and collected his army, but the enemy soon returned to London, and beset the city without, and fought strongly against it both by water and land. But the Almighty God delivered them. The enemy went afterward from London with their ships into the Orwell, where they went up and proceeded into Mercia, slaying and burning whatsoever they overtook, as their custom is, and, having provided themselves with meat, they drove their ships and their herds into the Medway. Then assembled King Edmund the fourth time all the English nation, and forded over the Thames at Brentford, whence he proceeded into Kent. The enemy fled before him with their horses into the Isle of Sheepy, and the king slew as many of them as he could overtake. Alderman Edric then went to meet the king at Aylesford, than which no measure could be more ill-advised. The enemy, meanwhile, returned into Essex and advanced into Mercia, destroying all that he overtook. When the king understood that the army was up, then collected he the fifth time all the English nation, and went behind them, and overtook them in Essex, on the down called Asingdon, where they fiercely came together. Then did Alderman Edric as he often did before he first began the flight with the maze of Ethians, and so betrayed his natural lord and all the people of England. There had newt the victory, though all England fought against him. There was then slain Bishop Ednoth, and Abbot Wolsey, and Alderman Elfric, and Alderman Godwin of Lindsay, and Ulfkitel of East Anglia, and Ethelward, the son of Alderman Ethelsey. And all the nobility of the English nation was there undone. After this fight, went King Newt up with his army into Gloucestershire, where he heard say that King Edmund was. Then advised Alderman Edric, and the councillors that were there assembled, that the kings should make peace with each other, and produce hostages. Then both the kings met together at Olney, south of Deerhist, and became allies and sworn brothers. There they confirmed their friendship both with pledges and with oaths, and settled the pay of the army. With this covenant they parted, King Edmund took to Wessex and Newt to Mercia and the northern district. The army then went to their ships with the things they had taken, and the people of London made peace with them, and purchased their security, whereupon they brought their ships to London, and provided themselves winter quarters therein. On the feast of St. Andrew died King Edmund, and he is buried with his grandfather Edgar at Gastonbury. In the same year died Wolfgar, abbot of Abingdon, and Ethelsey took to the abbacy. A.D. 1017. This year, King Newt took to the whole government of England, and divided it into four parts, Wessex for himself, East Anglia for Thurkill, Mercia for Edric, Northumbria for Eric. This year also was Alderman Edric slain at London, and Norman, son of Alderman Leofwin, and Ethelward, son of Ethelmar the Great, and Britric, son of Elphege of Devonshire. King Newt also banished Edwy Etheling, whom he afterwards ordered to be slain, and Edwy, king of the Churls, and before the Calans of August the king gave an order to fetch him the widow of the other king, Ethelred, the daughter of Richard, to wife. A.D. 1018 this year was the payment of the tribute over all England, that was, altogether, two and seventy thousand pounds, besides that which the citizens of London paid, and that was ten thousand five hundred pounds. The army then went partly to Denmark, and forty ships were left with King Newt. The Danes and Angles were united at Oxford under Edgar's law, and this year died Abbot Ethelsey at Abingdon, to whom Ethelwine succeeded. A.D. 1019 this year went King Newt with nine ships to Denmark, where he abode all the winter, and Archbishop Elfstan died this year, who was also named Lifing. He was a very upright man both before God and before the world. A.D. 1020 This year came King Newt back to England, and there was at Easter a great council at Cirencester, where Alderman Ethelward was outlawed, and Edwy, King of the Churls. This year went the king to Asingdon, with Earl Thurkill, and Archbishop Wolfston, and other bishops, and also abbots, and many monks with them, and he ordered to be built there a minster of stone and lime, for the souls of the men who were there slain, and gave it to his own priest, whose name was Stigand, and they consecrated the minster at Asingdon. And Ethelmoth the monk, who had been dean at Christ's Church, was the same year on the Ides of November consecrated bishop of Christ's Church by Archbishop Wolfston. A.D. 1021 this year King Newt, at Martinmas, outlawed Earl Thurkill, and Bishop Elfgar, the abundant giver of alms, died in the morning of Christmas Day. 
AD 1022. This year went King Nude out with his ships to the Isle of Wight. And Bishop Ethelnoth went to Rome, where he was received with much honor by Benedict the magnificent Pope, who with his own hand placed the pall upon him, and with great pomp consecrated him Archbishop, and blessed him, on the knowns of October. The Archbishop on the selfsame day with the same pall performed Mass, as the Pope directed him, after which he was magnificently entertained by the Pope himself, and afterwards with a full blessing proceeded homewards. Abbot Leofwine, who had been unjustly expelled from Ely, was his companion, and he cleared himself of everything, which, as the Pope informed him, had been laid to his charge, on the testimony of the Archbishop and of all the company that were with him. A.D. 1023. This year returned King Newt to England, and Thurkill and he were reconciled. He committed Denmark and his son to the care of Thurkill, whilst he took Thurkill's son with him to England. This year died Archbishop Wolfston, and Elfric succeeded him, and Archbishop Egelnoth blessed him in Canterbury. This year King Newt in London, in St. Paul's Minster, gave full leave to Archbishop Ethelnoth, Bishop Britwine, and all God's servants that were with them, that they might take up from the grave the Archbishop, St. Elphege. And they did so, on the sixth day before the Ides of June, and the illustrious king, and the archbishop, and the diocesan bishops, and the earls, and very many others, both clergy and laity, carried by ship his holy corpse over the Thames to Southwark. And there they committed the holy martyr to the archbishop and his companions, and they with worthy pomp and sprightly joy carried him to Rochester. There on the third day came the Lady Emma with her royal son Hardicknut, and they all with much majesty, and bliss, and psalms of praise, carried the holy Archbishop into Canterbury, and so brought him gloriously into the church, on the third day before the Ides of June. Afterwards, on the eighth day, the seventeenth before the Calends of July, Archbishop Ethelnoth, and Bishop Elfsey, and Bishop Britwine, and all they that were with them, lodged the holy corpse of St. Elphege on the north side of the altar of Christ, to the praise of God, and to the glory of the holy Archbishop, and to the everlasting salvation of all those who there his holy body daily seek with earnest heart and all humility. May God Almighty have mercy on all Christian men through the holy intercession of Elphege. A.D. 1025. This year went King Newt to Denmark with a fleet to the home by the Holy River, where against him came Ulf and Eglaf, with a very large force both by land and sea, from Sweden. There were very many men lost on the side of King Newt, both of Danish and English, and the Swedes had possession of the field of battle. A.D. 1026. This year went Bishop Elfric to Rome, and received the pall of Pope John on the second day before the Ides of November. A.D. 1028. This year went King Newt from England to Norway with fifty ships manned with English thanes, and drove King Olavi from the land, which he entirely secured to himself. A.D. 1029. This year, King Newt returned home to England. A.D. 1030. This year returned King Olavi into Norway, but the people gathered together against him, and fought against him, and he was there slain, in Norway, by his own people, and was afterwards canonized. Before this, in the same year, died Hakon the Doughty Earl, at sea. A.D. 1031. This year returned King Newt, and as soon as he came to England he gave to Christ's church in Canterbury the haven of Sandwich, and all the rights that arise therefrom, on either side of the haven, so that when the tide is highest and fullest, and there be a ship floating as near the land as possible, and there be a man standing upon the ship with a taper axe in his hand, whithersoever the large taper axe might be thrown out of the ship, throughout all that land the ministers of Christ's church should enjoy their rights. This year went King Newt to Rome, and the same year, as soon as he returned home, he went to Scotland, and Malcolm, king of the Scots, submitted to him, and became his man, with two other kings, Macbeth and Gemmer, but he held his allegiance a little while only. Robert, Earl of Normandy, went this year to Jerusalem, where he died, and William, who was afterwards King of England, succeeded to the earldom, though he was a child. A.D. 1032 this year appeared that wild fire, such as no man ever remembered before, which did great damage in many places. The same year died Elfsey, Bishop of Winchester, and Elfwin, the king's priest, succeeded him. A.D. 1033. This year died Bishop Mirwhite in Somersetshire, who is buried at Glastonbury, and Bishop Leofsey, whose body resteth at Worcester, and to whose see Brida was promoted. A.D. 1034. 
This year died Bishop Etheric, who lies at Ramsey. A.D. 1035. This year died King Newt at Shaftesbury on the second day before the Ides of November, and he is buried at Winchester in the Old Minster. He was king over all England very near twenty winters. Soon after his decease, there was a council of all the nobles at Oxford, wherein Earl Leofric and almost all the thanes north of the Thames and the naval men in London chose Harold to be governor of all England for himself and his brother Hardicknut, who was in Denmark. Earl Godwin and all the eldest men in Wessex withstood it as long as they could, but they could do nothing against it. It was then resolved that Elfgiva, the mother of Hardicknut, should remain at Winchester with the household of the king her son. They held all Wessex in hand, and Earl Godwin was their chief man. Some men said of Harold that he was the son of King Newt and of Elfgiv the daughter of Alderman Elfelm, but it was thought very incredible by many men. He was, nevertheless, full king over all England. Harold himself said that he was the son of Newt and of Elfgiv the Hampshire lady, though it was not true, but he sent and ordered to be taken from her all the best treasure that she could not hold, which King Newt possessed, and she nevertheless abode there continually within the city as long as she could. A.D. 1036 this year came hither Alfred the innocent Etheling, son of King Ethelred, and wished to visit his mother, who abode at Winchester, but Earl Godwin, and other men who had much power in this land, did not suffer it, because such conduct was very agreeable to Harold, though it was unjust. Him did Godwin let, and in prison set. His friends, who did not fly, they slew promiscuously. And those they did not sell, like slaughtered cattle fell whilst some they spared to bind, only to wander blind. Some hamstrung, helpless stood, whilst others they pursued. A deed more dreary none in this our land was done, since Englishmen gave place to hordes of Danish race. But repose we must in God our trust, that blithe as day with Christ live they, who guiltless died their country's pride. The prince with courage met each cruel evil yet, till t'was decreed, they should him lead, all bound, as he was then, to Elyberifen. But soon their royal prize bereft they of his eyes. Then to the monks they brought their captive, where he sought a refuge from his foes till life's sad evening close. His body ordered then these good and holy men, according to his worth, low in the sacred earth, to the steeple full nigh, in the south ale to lie of the transept west his soul with Christ doth rest. A.D. 1037 this year men chose Harold king over all, and forsook Hardicknut, because he was too long in Denmark, and then drove out his mother Elgiva, the relict of King Newt, without any pity, against the raging winter. She, who was the mother of Edward as well as of King Hardicknut, sought then the peace of Baldwin by the South Sea. Then came she to Bruges, beyond sea, and Earl Baldwin well received her there, and he gave her a habitation at Bruges, and protected her, and entertained her there as long as she had need. Ere this in the same year died Ephi, the excellent dean of Evesham. A.D. 1038. This year died Ethelnoth, the good archbishop, on the Calends of November, and, within a little of this time, Bishop Ethelric in Sussex, who prayed to God that he would not let him live any time after his dear father Ethelnoth, and within seven nights of this he also departed. Then, before Christmas, died Bishop Brida in Worcestershire, and soon after this, Bishop Elfric in East Anglia. Then succeeded Bishop Edsey to the Archbishopric, Grimkedal to the See of Sussex, and Bishop Lifing to that of Worcestershire and Gloucestershire. A.D. 1039. This year happened the terrible wind, and Bishop Britmar died at Lichfield. The Welsh slew Edwin. Brother of Earl Leofric, and Thurkill, and Elfget, and many good men with them. This year also came Hardicknut to Bruges, where his mother was. A.D. 1040. This year died King Harold at Oxford, on the 16th before the Calends of April, and he was buried at Westminster. He governed England for years and sixteen weeks, and in his day's tribute was paid to sixteen ships, at the rate of eight marks for each steersman, as was done before in King Newt's days. The same year they sent after Hardicknut to Bruges, supposing they did well, and he came hither to Sandwich with sixty ships, seven nights before midsummer. He was soon received both by the Angles and Danes, though his advisers afterwards severely paid for it. They ordered a tribute for sixty-two ships, at the rate of eight marks for each steersman. Then were alienated from him all that before desired him, for he framed nothing royal during his whole reign. 
he ordered the dead herald to be dragged up and thrown into a ditch. This year rose the sester of wheat to fifty-five pence, and even further. This year Archbishop Edzi went to Rome. A.D. 1041. This year was the tribute paid to the army, that was, twenty-one thousand and ninety-nine pounds, and afterwards to thirty-two ships, eleven thousand and forty-eight pounds. This year also ordered Hardicknut to lay waste all Worcestershire on account of the two servants of his household who exacted the heavy tribute. That people slew them in the town within the minster. Early in the same year came Edward, the son of King Ethelred, hither to land, from Wheelland to Madrin. He was the brother of King Hardicknut and had been driven from this land for many years, but he was nevertheless sworn as king and abode in his brother's court while he lived. They were both sons of Elf gave Emma, who was the daughter of a Earl Richard. In this year also Hardicknut betrayed Edulf under the mask of friendship. He was also allied to him by marriage. This year was Egelric consecrated Bishop of York on the third day before the Ides of January. A.D. 1042. This year died King Hardicknut at Lambeth, as he stood drinking, he fell suddenly to the earth with a tremendous struggle, but those who were nigh at hand took him up, and he spoke not a word afterwards, but expired on the sixth day before the Ides of June. He was king over all England two years wanting ten nights, and he is buried in the old minster at Winchester with King Newt his father. And his mother for his soul gave to the new minster the head of St. Valentine the Martyr, and ere he was buried all people chose Edward for king in London. And they received him as their king, as was natural, and he reigned as long as God granted him. All that year was the season very severe in many and various respects, both from the inclemency of the weather and the loss of the fruits of the earth. More cattle died this year than any man ever remembered either from various diseases or from the severity of the weather. At this same time died Elf Sinus, abbot of Peterborough, and they chose Arnwy, a monk, for their abbot, because he was a very good and benevolent man. A.D. 1043. This year was Edward consecrated king at Winchester, early on Easter Day, with much pomp. Then was Easter on the third day before the Nones of April. Archbishop Edzi consecrated him, and before all people well admonished him. And Stigan the priest was consecrated bishop over the East Angles. And this year, fourteen nights before the Mass of St. Andrew, it was advised the king that he and Earl Leofric and Earl Godwin and Earl Seward with their retinue should ride from Gloucester to Winchester unawares upon the lady, and they deprived her of all the treasures that she had, which were immense, because she was formerly very hard upon the king her son, and did less for him than he wished before he was king, and also since, but they suffered her to remain there afterwards. And soon after this the king determined to invest all the land that his mother had in her hands, and took from her all that she had in gold and in silver and in numberless things, because she formerly held it too fast against him. Soon after this Stigand was deprived of his bishopric, and they took all that he had into their hands for the king, because he was nighest the counsel of his mother, and she acted as he advised, as men supposed. A.D. 1044 this year Archbishop Edzi resigned his see from infirmity and consecrated Seward, abbot of Abingdon, bishop thereto, with the permission and advice of the king and Earl Godwin. It was known to few men else before it was done, because the archbishop feared that some other men would either beg or buy it, whom he might worse trust and oblige than him if it were known to many men. This year there was very great hunger over all England, and corn so dear as no man remembered before, so that the sester of wheat rose to sixty pence, and even further. And the same year the king went out to Sandwich with thirty-five ships, and Athelstan, the churchwarden, succeeded to the abbacy of Abingdon, and Stigand returned to his bishopric. In the same year also King Edward took to wife Edgitha, the daughter of Earl Godwin, ten nights before Candlemas. And in the same year died Britwold, bishop of Wiltshire, on the tenth day before the Calends of May, which bishopric he held thirty-eight winters, that was, the bishopric of Sherborne. And Herman, the king's priest, succeeded to the bishopric. This year Wilfric was consecrated abbot of St. Augustine's at Christmas, on the mass day of St. Stephen, by the king's leave and that of Abbot Elfstan, by reason of his great infirmity. A.D. 1045. This year died Elfward, bishop of London, on the eighth day before the Calends of August. He was formerly abbot of Evesham, and well furthered that monastery the while that he was there. 
he went then to Ramsey, and there resigned his life, and Manny was chosen abbot, being consecrated on the fourth day before the Ides of August. This year Gunilda, a woman of rank, a relative of King Newt, was driven out and resided afterwards at Bruges a long while and then went to Denmark. King Edward during the year collected a large fleet at Sandwich, through the threatening of Magnus of Norway, but his contests with Swain in Denmark prevented him from coming hither. AD 1046 This year died lifting, the eloquent bishop, on the tenth day before the Calends of April. He had three bishoprics, one in Devonshire, one in Cornwall, and another in Worcestershire. Then succeeded Leofric, who was the king's priest, to Devonshire and to Cornwall, and Bishop Aldred to Worcestershire. This year died Elfwine, Bishop of Winchester, on the fourth day before the Calends of September, and Stigand, Bishop of Norfolk, was raised to his see. Ere this, in the same year, died Grimkedal, Bishop of Sussex, and he lies at Christ Church, in Canterbury. And Hika, the king's priest, succeeded to the bishopric. Swain also sent hither, and requested the aid of fifty ships against Magnus, king of the Norwegians, but it was thought unwise by all the people, and it was prevented, because that Magnus had a large navy, and he drove Swain out, and with much slaughter won the land. The Danes then gave him much money, and received him as king. The same year Magnus died. The same year also Earl Swain went out to Baldwin's land, to Bruges, and remained there all the winter. In the summer he departed. AD 1046. This year went Earl Swain into Wales, and Griffin, king of the northern men with him, and hostages were delivered to him. As he returned homeward, he ordered the abbess of Leminster to be fetched him, and he had her as long as he list, after which he let her go home. In this same year was outlawed Osgod Kloppa, the master of horse, before midwinter. And in the same year, after Candlemas, came the strong winter, with frost and with snow, and with all kinds of bad weather, so that there was no man then alive who could remember so severe a winter as this was, both through loss of men and through loss of cattle, yea, fowls and fishes through much cold and hunger perished. AD 1047 this year died Athelstan, abbot of Abingdon, on the fourth day before the Calends of April, and Sparhawk, monk of St. Edmundsbury, succeeded him. Easter Day was then on the third day before the Nones of April, and there was over all England very great loss of men this year also. The same year came to Sandwich Lodhen and Erling, with twenty-five ships, and plundered and took incalculable spoil, in men, and in gold, and in silver, so that no man wist what it all was, and went then about Thanet, and would there have done the same, but the land folk firmly withstood, and resisted them both by land and sea, and thence put them to flight withal. They betook themselves thence into Essex, where they plundered and took men, and whatsoever they could find, whence they departed eastward to Baldwin's land, and having deposited the booty they had gained, they returned east to the place whence they had come before. AD 1048 This year came Swain back to Denmark, and Harold, the uncle of Magnus, went to Norway on the death of Magnus, and the Northmen submitted to him. He sent an embassy of peace to this land, as did also Swain from Denmark, requesting of King Edward naval assistance to the amount at least of fifty ships, but all the people resisted it. This year also there was an earthquake, on the Calends of May, in many places, at Worcester, at Wick, and at Derby, and elsewhere wide throughout England, with very great loss by disease of men and of cattle over all England, and the wildfire in Derbyshire and elsewhere did much harm. In the same year, the enemy plundered Sandwich, and the Isle of Wight, and slew the best men that were there, and King Edward and the earls went out after them with their ships. The same year Bishop Seward resigned his bishopric from infirmity, and retired to Abingdon, upon which Archbishop Edzi resumed the bishopric, and he died within eight weeks of this, on the tenth day before the Calends of November. AD 1049 this year the emperor gathered an innumerable army against Baldwin of Bruges, because he had destroyed the palace of Nymwyn, and because of many other ungracious acts that he did against him. The army was immense that he had collected together. There was Leo, the Pope of Rome, and the Patriarch, and many other great men of several provinces. He sent also to King Edward, and requested of him naval aid, that he might not permit him to escape from him by water. Whereupon he went to Sandwich, and lay there with a large naval armament, until the emperor had all that he wished of Baldwin. Thither also came back again Earl Swain, who had gone from this land to Denmark, and there ruined his cause with the Danes. 
He came hither with a pretense, saying that he would again submit to the king and be his man, and he requested Earl Bjorn to be of assistance to him and give him land to feed him on. But Harold, his brother, and Earl Bjorn resisted and would give him nothing of that which the king had given them. The king also refused him everything. Whereupon Sweden retired to his ships at Bosham. Then, after the settlement between the emperor and Baldwin, many ships went home, and the king remained behind Sandwich with a few ships. Earl Godwin also sailed forty-two ships from Sandwich to Pevensey, and Earl Bjorn went with him. Then the king gave leave to all the Mercians to return home, and they did so. Then it was told the king that Osgod lay at Ulps with thirty-nine ships, whereupon the king sent after the ships that he might dispatch, which before had gone homewards, but still lay at the Noor. Then Osgod fetched his wife from Bruges, and they went back again with six ships, but the rest went towards Essex, to Edolf's Ness, and there plundered, and then returned to their ships. But there came upon them a strong wind, so that they were all lost, but four persons, who were afterwards slain beyond sea. Whilst Earl Godwin and Earl Bjorn lay at Pevensey with their ships, came Earl Swain, and with a pretense requested of Earl Bjorn, who was his uncle's son, that he would be his companion to the king at Sandwich, and better his condition with him, adding, that he would swear oaths to him, and be faithful to him. Whereupon Bjorn concluded, that he would not for their relationship betray him. He therefore took three companions with him, and they rode to Bosham, where his ships lay, as though they should proceed to Sandwich, but they suddenly bound him, and led him to the ships, and went thence with him to Dartmouth, where they ordered him to be slain and buried deep. He was afterwards found, and Harold his cousin fetched him thence, and led him to Winchester, to the old minster, where he buried him with King Newt, his uncle. Then the king and all the army proclaimed Swain an outlaw. A little before this the men of Hastings and thereabout fought his two ships with their ships, and slew all the men, and brought the ships to Sandwich to the king. Eight ships had he, ere he betrayed Bjorn, afterwards they all forsook him except two, whereupon he went eastward to the land of Baldwin, and sat there all the winter at Bruges, in full security. In the same year came up from Ireland thirty-six ships on the Welsh coast, and thereabout committed outrages, with the aid of Griffin, the Welsh king. The people were soon gathered against them, and there was also with them Bishop Eldred, but they had too little assistance, and the enemy came unawares on them very early in the morning, and slew on the spot many good men, but the others burst forth with the bishop. This was done on the fourth day, before the Calends of August. This year died the good Bishop Ednoth in Oxfordshire, and Oswy, Abbot of Thalmy, and Wolfnoth, Abbot of Westminster, and King Edward gave the bishopric which Ednoth had to Ulf his priest, but it ill betided him, and he was driven from it, because he did not like a bishop therein, so that it shameth us now to say more. Bishop Seward also died who lies at Abingdon. In the same year King Edward put nine ships out of pay, and the crews departed, and went away with the ships withal, leaving five ships only behind, for whom the king ordered twelve months' pay. The same year went bishops Hearman and Aldred to the Pope at Rome on the king's errand. This year was also consecrated the great minster at Reims, in the presence of Pope Leo and the Emperor. There was also a great synod at St. Remy, at which was present Pope Leo, with the archbishops of Burgundy, of Besancon, of Treves, and of Reims, and many wise men besides, both clergy and laity. A great synod there held they respecting the service of God, at the instance of St. Leo the Pope. It is difficult to recognize all the bishops that came thither, and also abbots. King Edward sent thither Bishop Dudoc, and Abbot Wilfric, of St. Augustine's, and Elfwin, Abbot of Ramsey, with the intent that they should report to the king what was determined there concerning Christendom. This same year came Earl Swain into England. A.D. 1050. This year returned the bishops home from Rome, and Earl Swain had his sentence of outlawry reversed. The same year died Edzi, Archbishop of Canterbury, on the fourth day before the Calends of November, and also in the same year Elfric, Archbishop of York, on the eleventh before the Calends of February, a very venerable man and wise, and his body lies at Peterborough. Then had King Edward a meeting of the Great Council in London, in Midland, at which he appointed Robert the Frank, who was before Bishop of London, Archbishop of Canterbury, and he, during the same Lent, went to Rome after his Paul. The king meanwhile gave the See of London to Sparhawk, abbot of Abingdon, but it was taken from him again before he was consecrated. The king also gave the abbacy of Abingdon to Bishop Rodolph his cousin. The same year he put all the lighter men out of pay. 
the Pope held a council again at Vercelli, and Bishop Wolf came thither, where he nearly had his staff broken, had he not paid more money, because he could not perform his duties so well as he should do. The same year, King Edward abolished the Danegeld, which King Ethelred imposed. That was in the thirty-ninth year after it had begun. That tribute harassed all the people of England so long as is above written, and it was always paid before other imposts, which were levied indiscriminately and vexed men variously. A.D. 1051 This year came Archbishop Robert hither over sea with his Paul from Rome, one day before St. Peter's Eve, and he took his archiepiscopal seat at Christ Church on St. Peter's Day, and soon after this went to the king. Then came Abbot Sparhawk to him with the king's writ and seal, to the intent that he should consecrate him Bishop O.A. London, but the archbishop refused, saying that the pope had forbidden him. Then went the abbot to the archbishop again for the same purpose, and there demanded episcopal consecration, but the archbishop obstinately refused, repeating that the pope had forbidden him. Then went the abbot to London, and sat at the bishopric which the king had before given him, with his full leave, all the summer and the autumn. Then during the same year came Eustace, who had the sister of King Edward to wife, from beyond sea, soon after the bishop, and went to the king, and having spoken with him whatever he chose, he then went homeward. When he came to Canterbury eastward, there took he a repast, and his men, whence he proceeded to Dover. When he was about a mile or more on this side Dover, he put on his breastplate, and so did all his companions, and they proceeded to Dover. When they came thither, they resolved to quarter themselves wherever they lived. Then came one of his men, and would lodge at the house of a master of a family against his will, but having wounded the master of the house, he was slain by the other. Then was Eustace quickly upon his horse, and his companions upon theirs, and having gone to the master of the family, they slew him on his own hearth, then going up to the borough ward, they slew both within and without more than twenty men. The townsmen slew nineteen men on the other side, and wounded more, but they knew not how many. Eustace escaped with a few men, and went again to the king, telling him partially how they had fared. The king was very wroth with the townsmen, and sent off Earl Godwin, bidding him go into Kent, with hostility to Dover. For Eustace had told the king that the guilt of the townsmen was greater than his. But it was not so, and the earl would not consent to the expedition, because he was loath to destroy his own people. Then sent the king after all his council, and bade them come to Gloucester nigh the aftermath of St. Mary. Meanwhile, Godwin took it much to heart, that in his earldom such a thing should happen. Whereupon we began to gather forces over all his earldom, and Earl Swain, his son, over his, and Harold, his other son, over his earldom, and they assembled all in Gloucestershire, at Langtry, a large and innumerable army, all ready for battle against the king, unless Eustace and his men were delivered to them handcuffed, and also the Frenchmen that were in the castle. This was done seven nights before the latter mass of St. Mary, when King Edward was sitting at Gloucester. Whereupon he sent after Earl Leofric, and north after Earl Seward, and summoned their retinues. At first they came to him with moderate aid, but when they found how it was in the south, then sent they north over all their earldom, and ordered a large force to the help of their lord. So did Ralph also over his earldom. Then came they all to Gloucester to the aid of the king, though it was late. So unanimous were they all in defense of the king, that they would seek Godwin's army if the king desired it. But some prevented that, because it was very unwise that they should come together, for in the two armies was there almost all that was noblest in England. They therefore prevented this, that they might not leave the land at the mercy of our foes, whilst engaged in a destructive conflict betwixt ourselves. Then it was advised that they should exchange hostages between them. And they issued proclamations throughout to London, whither all the people were summoned over all this north end in Seward's earldom, and in Leofric's, and also elsewhere, and Earl Godwin was to come thither with his sons to a conference, they came as far as Southwark, and very many with them from Wessex, but his army continually diminished more and more, for they bound over to the king all the thanes that belonged to Earl Harold his son, and outlawed Earl Swain his other son. When therefore it could not serve his purpose to come to a conference against the king and against the army that was with him, he went in the night away. In the morning the king held a council and proclaimed him an outlaw, with his whole army, himself and his wife, and all his three sons Swain and Toasty and Grith. And he went south to Thorny, with his wife, and Swain his son, and Toasty and his wife, a cousin of Baldwin of Bruges, and his son Grith. 
Earl Harold with Leofwine went to Bristol in the ship that Earl Swain had before prepared and provisioned for himself, and the king sent Bishop Aldred from London with his retinue, with orders to overtake him ere he came to ship. But they either could not or would not, and he then went out from the mouth of the Avon, but he encountered such adverse weather that he got off with difficulty and suffered great loss. He then went forth to Ireland, as soon as the weather permitted. In the meantime, the Welshmen had wrought a castle in Herefordshire, in the territory of Earl Swain, and brought as much injury and disgrace on the king's men thereabout as they could. Then came Earl Godwin, and Earl Swain, and Earl Harold, together at Beverstone, and many men with them, to the intent that they might go to their natural lord, and to all the peers that were assembled with him, to have the king's counsel and assistance, and that of all the peers, how they might avenge the insult offered to the king, and to all the nation. But the Welshmen were before with the king, and berated the earls, so that they were not permitted to come within the sight of his eyes, for they declared that they intended to come thither to betray the king. There was now assembled before the king Earl Seward, and Earl Leofric, and much people with them from the north, and it was told Earl Godwin and his sons, that the king and the men who were with him would take counsel against them, but they prepared themselves firmly to resist, though they were loath to proceed against their natural lord. Then advised the peers on either side, that they should abstain from all hostility, and the king gave God's peace and his full friendship to each party. Then advised the king and his council, that there should be a second time a general assembly of all the nobles in London, at the autumnal equinox, and the king ordered out an army both south and north of the Thames, the best that ever was. Then was Earl Swain proclaimed an outlaw, and Earl Godwin and Earl Harold were summoned to the council as early as they could come. When they came thither and were cited to the council, then required they security and hostages, that they might come into the council and go out without treachery. The king then demanded all the thanes that the earls had, and they put them all into his hands. Then sent the king again to them, and commanded them to come with twelve men to the king's council. Then desired the earl again security and hostages, that he might answer singly to each of the things that were laid to his charge. But the hostages were refused, and a truce of five nights was allowed him to depart from the land. Then went Earl Godwin and Earl Swain to Bosham, and drew out their ships, and went beyond sea, seeking the protection of Baldwin, and there they abode all the winter. Earl Harold went westward to Ireland, and was there all the winter on the king's security. It was from Thorny that Godwin and those that were with him went to Bruges, to Baldwin's land, in one ship, with as much treasure as they could lodge therein for each man. Wonderful would it have been thought by every man that was then in England, if any person had said before this that it would end thus. For he was before raised to such a height, that he ruled the king and all England, his sons were earls, and the king's darlings, and his daughter wedded and united to the king. Soon after this took place, the king dismissed the lady who had been consecrated his queen, and ordered to be taken from her all that she had in land, and in gold, and in silver, and in all things, and committed her to the care of his sister at Werewell. Soon after came Earl William from beyond sea with a large retinue of Frenchmen, and the king entertained him and as many of his companions as were convenient to him, and let him depart again. Then was Abbot Sparhawk driven from his bishopric at London, and William the king's priest was invested therewith. Then was Audi appointed Earl over Devonshire, and over Somerset, and over Dorset, and over Wales, and Algar, the son of Earl Leofric, was promoted to the earldom which Harold before possessed. A.D. 1052. This year, on the second day before the Nones of March, died the aged Lady Elfgiva Emma, the mother of King Edward and of King Hardicknut, the relict of King Ethelred and of King Newt, and her body lies in the old minster with King Newt. At this time Griffin, the Welsh king, plundered in Herefordshire till he came very nigh to Leominster, and they gathered against him both the landsmen and the Frenchmen from the castle, and there were slain very many good men of the English, and also of the French. This was on the same day thirteen years after that Edwin was slain with his companions. In the same year advised the king and his council that ships should be sent out to Sandwich, and that Earl Ralph and Earl Otta should be appointed headmen thereto. Then went Earl Godwin out from Bruges with his ships to Isendic, and sailed forth one day before Midsummer Eve, till he came to the nest that is to the south of Romney. When it came to the knowledge of the earls out at Sandwich, they went out after the other ships, and a land force was also ordered out against the ships. Meanwhile Earl Godwin had warning, and betook himself into Pevensey, and the weather was so boisterous, that the earls could not learn what had become of Earl Godwin. 
but Earl Godwin then went out again until he came back to Bruges, and the other ships returned back again to Sandwich. Then it was advised that the ships should go back again to London, and that other earls and other pilots should be appointed over them. But it was delayed so long that the Marine army all deserted, and they all betook themselves home. When Earl Godwin understood that, he drew up his sail and his ship, and they went west at once to the Isle of Wight, and landing there, they plundered so long that the people gave them as much as they required of them. Then proceeded they westward until they came to Portland, where they landed and did as much harm as they could possibly do. Meanwhile, Harold had gone out from Ireland with nine ships and came up at Potlock with his ships to the mouth of the Severn, near the boundaries of Somerset and Devonshire, and there plundered much. The land folk collected against him, both from Somerset and from Devonshire, but he put them to flight, and slew there more than thirty good thanes, besides others, and went soon after about Penwithstert, where was much people gathered against him, but he spared not to provide himself with meat, and went up and slew on the spot a great number of the people seizing in cattle, in men, and in money, whatever he could. Then went he eastward to his father, and they went both together eastward until they came to the Isle of Wight, where they seized whatever had been left them before. Thence they went to Pevensey, and got out with them as many ships as had gone in there, and so proceeded forth till they came to the Ness, getting all the ships that were at Romney, and at Hythe, and at Folkestone. Then ordered King Edward to fit out forty smacks that lay at Sandwich many weeks, to watch Earl Godwin, who was at Bruges during the winter, but he nevertheless came hither first to land, so as to escape their notice. And whilst he abode in this land, he enticed to him all the Kentish men, and all the boatmen from Hastings, and everywhere thereabout by the sea coast, and all the men of Essex and Sussex and Surrey, and many others besides. Then said they all that they would with him live or die. When the fleet that lay at Sandwich had intelligence about Godwin's expedition, they set sail after him, but he escaped them, and betook himself wherever he might, and the fleet returned to Sandwich, and so homeward to London. When Godwin understood that the fleet that lay at Sandwich was gone home, then went he back again to the Isle of Wight, and lay there about by the seacoast so long that they came together he and his son Earl Harold. But they did no great harm after they came together, save that they took meat, and enticed to them all the land folk by the sea coast and also upward in the land. And they proceeded toward Sandwich, ever alluring forth with them all the boatmen that they met, and to Sandwich they came with an increasing army. They then steered eastward round to Dover, and landing there, took as many ships and hostages as they chose, and so returned to Sandwich, where they did the same, and men everywhere gave them hostages and provisions, wherever they required them. Then proceeded they to the Knower, and so toward London, but some of the ships landed on the Isle of Sheepy, and did much harm there, whence they steered to Milton Regis, and burned it all, and then proceeded toward London after the Earls. When they came to London, there lay the king and all his earls to meet them, with fifty ships. The earls then sent to the king, praying that they might be each possessed of those things which had been unjustly taken from them. But the king resisted some while, so long that the people who were with the earl were very much stirred against the king and against his people, so that the earl himself with difficulty appeased them. When King Edward understood that, then sent he upward after more aid, but they came very late. And Godwin stationed himself continually before London with his fleet, till he came to Southwark, where he abode some time, until the flood came up. On this occasion he also contrived with the Burgesses that they should do almost all that he would. When he had arranged his whole expedition, then came the flood, and they soon weighed anchor, and steered through the bridge by the south side. The land force meanwhile came above, and arranged themselves by the strand, and they formed an angle with the ships against the north side, as if they wished to surround the king's ships. The king had also a great land force on his side, to add to his shipmen, but they were most of them loath to fight with their own kinsmen, for there was little else of any great importance but Englishmen on either side, and they were also unwilling that this land should be the more exposed to outlandish people, because they destroyed each other. Then it was determined that wise men should be sent between them, who should settle peace on either side. Godwin went up, and Harold his son, and their navy, as many as they then thought proper. Then advanced Bishop Stigand with God's assistance, and the wise men both within the town and without, who determined that hostages should be given on either side. And so they did. When Archbishop Robert and the Frenchmen knew that, they took horse, and went some west to Pentecost Castle, some north to Robert's Castle. 
Archbishop Robert and Bishop Ulf, with their companions, went out at Eastgate, slaying or else maiming many young men, and betook themselves at once to Edolf's Ness, where he put himself on board a crazy ship, and went at once over sea, leaving his Paul and all Christendom here on land, as God ordained, because he had obtained an honour which God disclaimed. Then was proclaimed a general council without London, and all the earls and the best men in the land were at the council. There took up Earl Godwin his burthen, and cleared himself there before his lord King Edward, and before all the nation, proving that he was innocent of the crime laid to his charge, and to his son Harold, and all his children. And the king gave the earl and his children, and all the men that were with him, his full friendship, and the full earldom, and all that he possessed before, and he gave the lady all that she had before. Archbishop Robert was fully proclaimed an outlaw, with all the Frenchmen, because they chiefly made the discord between Earl Godwin and the King, and Bishop Stiggins succeeded to the Archbishopric at Canterbury. At the council therefore they gave Godwin fairly his earldom, so full and so free as he at first possessed it, and his sons also all that they formerly had, and his wife and his daughter so full and so free as they formerly had. And they fastened full friendship between them and ordained good laws to all people. Then they outlawed all Frenchmen who before instituted bad laws and judged unrighteous judgment and brought bad counsels into this land except so many as they concluded it was agreeable to the king to have with him, who were true to him and to all his people. It was with difficulty that Bishop Robert and Bishop William and Bishop Wolf escaped with the Frenchmen that were with them and so went over sea. Earl Godwin and Harold and the Queen sat in their stations. Swain had before gone to Jerusalem from Bruges and died on his way home at Constantinople at Michaelmas. It was on the Monday after the festival of St. Mary that Godwin came with his ships to Southwark and on the morning afterwards, on the Tuesday, they were reconciled as it stands here before recorded. Godwin then sickened soon after he came up and returned back. But he made altogether too little restitution of God's property which he acquired from many places. At the same time Arnwy, abbot of Peterborough, resigned his abbacy in full health, and gave it to the monk Leofric, with the king's leave and that of the monks, and the abbot Arnwy lived afterwards eight winters. The abbot Leofric gilded the minster, so that it was called Gildenborough, and it then waxed very much in land, and in gold, and in silver. A.D. 1053 About this time was the great wind, on the mass night of St. Thomas, which did much harm everywhere and all the midwinter also was much wind. It was this year resolved to slay Rees, the Welsh king's brother, because he did harm, and they brought his head to Gloucester on the eve of Twelfth Day. In this same year, before All Hallowmas, died Wolfsey, Bishop of Lichfield, and Godwin, Abbot of Winchcombe, and Aylward, Abbot of Glastonbury, all within one month. And Leof Wine, abbot of Coventry, took to the bishopric at Lichfield, Bishop Aldred to the abbacy at Winchcombe, and Aylnoth took to the abbacy at Glastonbury. The same year died Elfric, brother of Ada, at Deerhest, and his body resteth at Pershore. In this year was the king at Winchester, at Easter, and Earl Godwin with him, and Earl Harold his son, and Toasty. On the day after Easter sat he with the king at table, when he suddenly sunk beneath against the footrail, deprived of speech and of all his strength. He was brought into the king's chamber, and they supposed that it would pass over, but it was not so. He continued thus speechless and helpless till the Thursday, when he resigned his life, on the seventeenth before the Calends of May, and he was buried at Winchester in the Old Minster. Earl Harold, his son, took to the earldom that his father had before, and to all that his father possessed, whilst Earl Elgar took to the earldom that Harold had before. The Welsh men this year slew a great many of the warders of the English people at Westbury. This year there was no archbishop in this land, but Bishop Stigand held the see of Canterbury at Christ Church, and Kinsey that of York. Leofwine and Wolfwy went over sea, and had themselves consecrated bishops there. Wolfwy took to the bishopric which Ulf had whilst he was living and in exile. A.D. 1054. This year died Leo the Holy Pope, at Rome, and Victor was chosen Pope in his stead. And in this year was so great loss of cattle as was not remembered for many winters before. This year went Earl Seward with a large army against Scotland, consisting both of marines and land forces, and engaging with the Scots, he put to flight the King Macbeth, slew all the best in the land, and led thence much spoil, such as no man before obtained. 
many fell also on his side, both Danish and English, even his own son, Osborne, and his sister's son, Seward, and many of his housecarls, and also of the kings, were there slain that day, which was that of the seven sleepers. This same year went Bishop Aldred South oversea into Saxony, to Cologne, on the king's errand, where he was entertained with great respect by the emperor, abode there well nigh a year, and received presents not only from the court, but from the bishop of Cologne and the emperor. He commissioned Bishop Leofwine to consecrate the minster at Evesham, and it was consecrated in the same year, on the 6th before the Ides of October. This year also died Osgod Kloppa suddenly in his bed, as he lay at rest. A.D. 1055. This year died Earl Seward at York, and his body lies within the minster at Galmanho, which he had himself ordered to be built and consecrated, in the name of God and Saint Owen Ave, to the honor of God and to all his saints. Archbishop Kinsey fetched his pall from Pope Victor. Then, within a little time after, a general council was summoned in London, seven nights before Midland, at which Earl Elgar, son of Earl Leofric, was outlawed almost without any guilt, because it was said against him that he was the betrayer of the king and of all the people of the land. And he was arraigned thereof before all that were there assembled, though the crime laid to his charge was unintentional. The king, however, gave the earldom, which Earl Seward formerly had, to Toasty, son of Earl Godwin. Whereupon Earl Elgar sought Griffin's territory in North Wales, whence he went to Ireland, and there gave him a fleet of eighteen ships, besides his own, and then returned to Wales to King Griffin with the armament, who received him on terms of amity. And they gathered a great force with the Irishmen and the Welsh, and Earl Ralph collected a great army against them at the town of Hereford, where they met, but ere there was a spear thrown the English people fled, because they were on horses. The enemy then made a great slaughter there, about four hundred or five hundred men, they on the other side none. They went then to the town, and burned it utterly, and the large minster also which the worthy Bishop Athelstan had caused to be built, that they plundered and bereft of relic and of reef, and of all things whatever, and the people they slew, and led some away. Then an army from all parts of England was gathered very nigh, and they came to Gloucester, whence they sallied not far out against the Welsh, and there lay some time. And Earl Harold caused the dyke to be dug about the town the while. Meantime men began to speak of peace, and Earl Harold and those who were with him came to Bilsley, where amity and friendship were established between them. The sentence of outlawry against Earl Elgar was reversed, and they gave him all that was taken from him before. The fleet returned to Chester, and there awaited their pay, which Elgar promised them. The slaughter was on the ninth, before the Calends of November. In the same year died Tremorig, the Welsh bishop, soon after the plundering, who was Bishop Athelstan's substitute, after he became infirm. A.D. 1056. This year Bishop Egelric resigned his bishopric at Durham and retired to Peterborough Minster, and his brother Egelwine succeeded him. The worthy Bishop Athelstan died on the 4th, before the Ides of February, and his body lies at Hereford. To him succeeded Leofgar, who was Earl Harold's mass priest. He wore his knapsack in his priesthood until he was a bishop. He abandoned his chrism and his rude, his ghostly weapons and took to his spear and to his sword after his bishophood and so marched to the field against Griffin the Welsh king. But he was there slain, and his priests with him, and Elnoth the sheriff, and many other good men with them, and the rest fled. This was eight nights before midsummer. Difficult is it to relate all the vexation and the journeying, the marching and the fatigue, the fall of men, and of horses also, which the whole army of the English suffered, until Earl Leofric and Earl Harold and Bishop Eldred came together and made peace between them, so that Griffin swore oaths that he would be a firm and faithful viceroy to King Edward. Then Bishop Eldred took to the bishopric which Leofgar had before eleven weeks and four days. The same year died Kona the Emperor, and Earl Ada, whose body lies at Pershore, and who was admitted a monk before his end, which was on the second before the Calends of September, a good man and virtuous and truly noble. A.D. 1057. This year came Edward Etheling, son of King Edmund, to this land, and soon after died. His body is buried within St. Paul's Minster at London. He was brother's son to King Edward. King Edmund was called Ironside for his valor. This Etheling King Newt had sent into Hungary to betray him, but he there grew in favor with good men, as God granted him, and it well became him, so that he obtained the emperor's cousin in marriage, and by her had a fair offspring. Her name was Agatha. 
We know not for what reason it was done, that he should see his relation, King Edward. Alas! That was a rueful time, and injurious to all this nation that he ended his life so soon after he came to England, to the misfortune of this miserable people. The same year died Earl Leofric, on the second before the Calends of October, who was very wise before God, and also before the world, and who benefited all this nation. He lies at Coventry, and his son Elgar took to his territory. This year died Earl Ralph, on the twelfth, before the Calends of January, and lies at Peterborough. Also died Bishop Hika, in Sussex, and Egelric was elevated to his see. This year also died Pope Victor, and Stephen was chosen Pope, who was abbot of Monarch Casino. A.D. 1058. This year was Earl Elgar banished, but he soon came in again by force, through Griffin's assistance, and a naval armament came from Norway. It is tedious to tell how it all fell out. In the same year Bishop Aldred consecrated the Minster Church at Gloucester, which he himself had raised to the honour of God and St. Peter, and then went to Jerusalem with such dignity as no other man did before him, and betook himself there to God. A worthy gift he also offered to our Lord's sepulchre, which was a golden chalice of the value of five marks, of very wonderful workmanship. In the same year died Pope Stephen, and Benedict was appointed Pope. He sent hither the Paul to Bishop Stigand, who as Archbishop consecrated Egelric a monk at Christ Church, Bishop of Sussex, and Abbot Seward Bishop of Rochester. A.D. 1059. This year was Nicholas chosen Pope, who had been Bishop of Florence, and Benedict was expelled, who was Pope before. This year also was consecrated the steeple at Peterborough, on the 16th before the Calends of November. A.D. 1060. This year was a great earthquake on the translation of St. Martin, and King Henry died in France. Kinsey, Archbishop of York, died on the 11th before the Calends of January, and he lies at Peterborough. Bishop Aldred succeeded to the see, and Walter to that of Herefordshire. Dudoc also died, who was Bishop of Somersetshire, and Jesus the priest was appointed in his stead. A.D. 1061 this year went Bishop Aldred to Rome after his Paul, which he received at the hands of Pope Nicholas. Earl Toasty and his wife also went to Rome, and the bishop and the earl met with great difficulty as they returned home. In the same year died Bishop Godwin at St. Martin's, on the 7th before the Ides of March, and in the selfsame year died Wilfric, abbot of St. Augustine's, in the Easter week, on the 14th before the Calends of May. Pope Nicholas also died, and Alexander was chosen Pope, who was Bishop of Lucca. When word came to the king that the abbot Wilfric was dead, then chose he Ethelsey, a monk of the Old Minster, to succeed, who followed Archbishop Stigand, and was consecrated abbot at Windsor on St. Augustine's Mass Day. A.D. 1063. This year went Earl Harold, after midwinter, from Gloucester to Ridlin, which belonged to Griffin, and that habitation he burned, with his ships and all the rigging belonging thereto, and put him to flight. Then in the gang days went Harold with his ships from Bristol about Wales, where he made a truce with the people, and they gave him hostages. Toasty meanwhile advanced, with a land force against them, and plundered the land. But in the harvest of the same year was King Griffin slain, on the knowns of August, by his own men, through the war that he waged with Earl Harold. He was king over all the Welsh nation. And his head was brought to Earl Harold, who sent it to the king, with his ship's head, and the rigging therewith. King Edward committed the land to his two brothers, Blethgent and Rigwaddle, who swore oaths, and gave hostages to the king and to the earl, that they would be faithful to him in all things, ready to aid him everywhere by water and land, and would pay him such tribute from the land as was paid long before to other kings. A.D. 1065 This year, before Lammas, ordered Earl Harold his men to build at Portsquath in Wales. But when he had begun, and collected many materials, and thought to have King Edward there for the purpose of hunting, even when it was all ready, came Caradoc, son of Griffin, with all the gang that he could get, and slew almost all that were building there, and they seized the materials that were there got ready. Wist we not who first advised the wicked deed? This was done on the mass day of St. Bartholomew. Soon after this all the thanes in Yorkshire and in Northumberland gathered themselves together at York, and outlawed their Earl Toasty, slaying all the men of his clan that they could reach, both Danish and English, and took all his weapons in York, with gold and silver, and all his money that they could anywhere there find. 
They then sent after Morker, son of Earl Elgar, and chose him for their earl. He went south with all the Shire, and with Nottinghamshire and Derbyshire and Lincolnshire, till he came to Northampton, where his brother Edwin came to meet him with the men that were in his earldom. Many Britons also came with him. Harold also there met them, on whom they imposed an errand to King Edward, sending also messengers with him, and requesting that they might have more car for their earl. This the king granted, and sent back Harold to them, to Northampton, on the eve of St. Simon and St. Jude, and announced to them the same, and confirmed it by hand, and renewed there the laws of Newt. But the northern men did much harm about Northampton, whilst he went on their errand, either that they slew men, and burned houses and corn, or took all the cattle that they could come at, which amounted to many thousands. Many hundred men also they took, and led northward with them, so that not only that shire, but others near it were the worse for many winters. Then Earl Toasty and his wife, and all they who acted with him, went south over sea with him to Earl Baldwin, who received them all, and they were there all the winter. About midwinter King Edward came to Westminster, and had the minster there consecrated, which he had himself built to the honour of God, and St. Peter, and all God's saints. This church hallowing was on Childermas Day. He died on the eve of Twelfth Day, and he was buried on Twelfth Day in the same minster, as it is hereafter said. Here Edward King, of Angles Lord, sent his steadfast soul, to Christ. In the kingdom of God a Holy Spirit. He in the world here abode a while, in the kingly throng of council sage. For in twenty winters wielding the scepter freely, wealth he dispensed. In the tide of health, the youthful monarch, offspring of Ethelred, ruled well his subjects, the Welsh and the Scots, and the Britons also, Angles and Saxons relations of old. So apprehend the first in rank, that to Edward all the noble king were firmly held high-seated men. Blithe-minded I was the harmless king, though he long heir, of land bereft, abode in exile wide on the earth, when Newt o'ercame the kin of Ethelred, and the Danes wielded the dear kingdom of Engelland. Eight and twenty winters rounds they wealth dispensed. Then came forth free in his chambers, in royal array, good, pure, and mild, Edward the noble, by his country defended by land and people. Until suddenly came the bitter death, and this king so dear, snatched from the earth. Angels carried his soul sincere into the light of heaven. But the prudent king had settled the realm on highborn men on Harold himself, the noble earl, who in every season faithfully heard and obeyed his lord, in word and deed, nor gave to any what might be wanted by the nation's king. This year also was Earl Harold hallowed to king, but he enjoyed little tranquility there in the while that he wielded the kingdom. A.D. 1066 This year came King Harold from York to Westminster, on the Easter succeeding the midwinter when the king, Edward, died. Easter was then on the sixteenth day before the Calends of May. Then was over all England such a token scene as no man ever saw before. Some men said that it was the comet star, which others denominate the long-haired star. It appeared first on the eve called Latania Major, that is, on the 8th, before the Calends of May, and so shone all the week. Soon after this came an Earl Toasty from beyond sea into the Isle of Wight, with as large a fleet as he could get, and he was there supplied with money and provisions. Thence he proceeded, and committed outrages everywhere by the seacoast where he could land, until he came to Sandwich. When it was told King Harold, who was in London, that his brother Toasty was come to Sandwich, he gathered so large a force, naval and military, as no king before collected in this land, for it was credibly reported that Earl William from Normandy, King Edward's cousin, would come hither and gain this land, just as it afterwards happened. When Toasty understood that King Harold was on the way to Sandwich, he departed thence, and took some of the boatmen with him, willing and unwilling, and went north into the Humber with sixty skips, whence he plundered in Lindsay, and there slew many good men. When the earls Edwin and Morker understood that, they came hither, and drove him from the land. And the boatmen forsook him. Then he went to Scotland with twelve smacks, and the king of the Scots entertained him, and aided him with provisions, and he abode there all the summer. There met him Harold, king of Norway, with three hundred ships. And Toasty submitted to him, and became his man. Then came King Harold to Sandwich, where he awaited his fleet, for it was long ere it could be collected, but when it was assembled, he went into the Isle of Wight, and there lay all the summer and the autumn. There was also a land force everywhere by the sea, though it availed not in the end. 
It was now the nativity of St. Mary when the provisioning of the men began, and no man could keep them there any longer. They therefore had leave to go home, and the king rode up, and the ships were driven to London, but many perished ere they came thither. When the ships were come home, then came Harold, king of Norway, north into the Tyne, unawares, with a very great sea force, no small one, that might be, with three hundred ships or more, and Earl Tosti came to him with all those that he had got, just as they had before said, and they both then went up with all the fleet along the Ouse toward York. When it was told King Harold in the south, after he had come from the ships, that Harold, King of Norway, and Earl Tosti were come up near York, then went he northward by day and night, as soon as he could collect his army. But, ere King Harold could come thither, the earls Edwin and Morker had gathered from their earldoms as great a force as they could get, and fought with the enemy. They made a great slaughter too, but there was a good number of the English people slain, and drowned, and put to flight, and the Northmen had possession of the field of battle. It was then told Harold, King of the English, that this had thus happened. And this fight was on the eve of St. Matthew the Apostle, which was Wednesday. Then after the fight went Harold, King of Norway, and Earl Tosti into York with as many followers as they thought fit, and having procured hostages and provisions from the city, they proceeded to their ships, and proclaimed full friendship, on condition that all would go southward with them, and gain this land. In the midst of this came Harold, King of the English, with all his army, on the Sunday, to Tadcaster, where he collected his fleet. Thence he proceeded on Monday throughout York. But Harold, King of Norway, and Earl Tosti, with their forces, were gone from their ships beyond York to Stanford Bridge, for that it was given them to understand that hostages would be brought to them there from all the Shire. Thither came Harold, King of the English, unawares against them beyond the bridge, and they closed together there, and continued long in the day fighting very severely. There was slain Harold the Fair-Haired, King of Norway, and Earl Tosti, and a multitude of people with them, both of Normans and English, and the Normans that were left fled from the English, who slew them hotly behind, until some came to their ships, some were drowned, some burned to death, and thus variously destroyed, so that there was little left, and the English gained possession of the field. But there was one of the Norwegians who withstood the English folk, so that they could not pass over the bridge, nor complete the victory. An Englishman aimed at him with a javelin, but it availed nothing. Then came another under the bridge, who pierced him terribly inwards under the coat of mail. And Harold, king of the English, then came over the bridge, followed by his army, and there they made a great slaughter, both of the Norwegians and of the Flemings. But Harold let the king's son, Edmund, go home to Norway with all the ships. He also gave quarter to Alavi, the Norwegian king's son, and to their bishop, and to the Earl of the Orkneys, and to all those that were left in the ships, who then went up to our king, and took oaths that they would ever maintain faith and friendship unto this land. Whereupon the king let them go home with twenty-four ships. These two general battles were fought within five nights. Meantime Earl William came up from Normandy into Pevensey on the eve of St. Michael's Mass, and soon after his landing was effected, they constructed a castle at the port of Hastings. This was then told to King Harold, and he gathered a large force, and came to meet him at the estuary of Appledore. William, however, came against him unawares, ere his army was collected, but the king, nevertheless, very hardly encountered him with the men that would support him, and there was a great slaughter made on either side. There was slain King Harold, and Leofwin his brother, and Earl Gerth his brother, with many good men, and the Frenchmen gained the field of battle, as God granted them for the sins of the nation. Archbishop Aldred and the Corporation of London were then desirous of having child Edgar to king, as he was quite natural to them, and Edwin and Morker promised them that they would fight with them. But the more prompt the business should ever be, so was it from day to day the later and worse, as in the end it all fared. This battle was fought on the day of Pope Calixtus, and Earl William returned to Hastings, and waited there to know whether the people would submit to him. But when he found that they would not come to him, he went up with all his force that was left and that came since to him from oversea, and ravaged all the country that he overran, until he came to Berkhampstead, where Archbishop Aldred came to meet him, with Child Edgar, and Earls Edwin and Morker, and all the best men from London, who submitted then for need, when the most harm was done. It was very ill-advised that they did not so before, seeing that God would not better things for our sins. And they gave him hostages and took oaths, and he promised them that he would be a faithful lord to them, though in the midst of this they plundered wherever they went. 
Then on Midwinter's Day Archbishop Aldred hallowed him to king at Westminster, and gave him possession with the books of Christ, and also swore him, ere that he would set the crown on his head, that he would so well govern this nation as any before him best did, if they would be faithful to him. Never heed us, he laid very heavy tribute on men, and in Lent went oversea to Normandy, taking with him Archbishop Stigand, and Abbot Aylmouth of Glastonbury, and the child Edgar, and the earls Edwin, Morker, and Walthief, and many other good men of England. Bishop Odo and Earl William lived here afterwards, and wrought castles widely through this country, and harassed the miserable people, and ever since his evil increased very much. May the end be good, when God will. In that same expedition was Leofric, abbot of Peterborough, who sickened there, and came home, and died soon after, on the night of All Hallow Mass. God honor his soul. In his day was all bliss and all good at Peterborough. He was beloved by all, so that the king gave to St. Peter and him the abbey at Burton, and that at Coventry, which the Earl Leofric, who was his uncle, had formerly made, with that of Croyland and that of Thorny. He did so much good to the minster of Peterborough, in gold, and in silver, and in shroud, and in land, as no other ever did before him, nor any one after him. But now was Gildenborough become a wretched borough. The monks then chose for Abbot Provost Brand, because he was a very good man, and very wise, and sent him to Edgar Etheling, for that the land folk supposed that he should be king, and the Etheling received him gladly. When King William heard say that, he was very wroth, and said that the abbot had renounced him, but good men went between them, and reconciled them, because the abbot was a good man. He gave the king forty marks of gold for his reconciliation, and he lived but a little while after only three years. Afterwards came all wretchedness and all evil to the minster. God have mercy on it. A.D. 1067 This year came the king back again to England on St. Nicholas's Day, and the same day was burned the Church of Christ at Canterbury. Bishop Wolfwee also died, and is buried at his see in Dorchester. The child Edric and the Britons were unsettled this year, and fought with the castlemen at Hereford, and did them much harm. The king this year imposed a heavy guild on the wretched people, but, notwithstanding, let his men always plunder all the country that they went over, and then he marched to Devonshire, and beset the city of Exeter eighteen days. There were many of his army slain, out he had promised them well, and performed ill, and the citizens surrendered the city because the thanes had betrayed them. This summer the child Edgar departed, with his mother Agatha, and his two sisters, Margaret and Christina, and Merle Swain, and many good men with them, and came to Scotland under the protection of King Malcolm, who entertained them all. Then began King Malcolm to yearn after the child's sister, Margaret, to wife, but he and all his men long refused, and she also herself was averse, and said that she would neither have him nor anyone else, if the supreme power would grant, that she and her maidenhood might please the mighty Lord with a carnal heart, in this short life, in pure continence. The king, however, earnestly urged her brother, until he answered ye. And indeed, he durst not otherwise, for they were come into his kingdom. So that then it was fulfilled, as God had long ere foreshowed, and else it could not be, as he himself saith in his gospel, that not even a sparrow on the ground may fall, without his foreshowing. The Prussian creator wist long before what he of her would have done, for that she should increase the glory of God in this land, lead the king aright from the path of error, bend him and his people together to a better way, and suppress the bad customs which the nation formerly followed, all which she afterwards did. The king therefore received her, though it was against her will, and was pleased with her manners, and thanked God, who in his might had given him such a match. He wisely bethought himself, as he was a prudent man, and turned himself to God, and renounced all impurity, accordingly, as the Apostle Paul, the teacher of all the gentries, saith, Salvabiter vir infidelis per miliarum fidelum, sicci timulier infidelis per virum fidelum, etc., that is in our language, full off the unbelieving husband is sanctified and healed through the believing wife, and so belike the wife through the believing husband. This queen aforesaid performed afterwards many useful deeds in this land to the glory of God, and also in her royal estate she well conducted herself, as her nature was. Of a faithful and noble kin was she sprung. Her father was Edward Etheling, son of King Edmund. Edmund was the son of Ethelred, Ethelred the son of Edgar, Edgar the son of Edred, and so forth in that royal line, and her maternal kindred goeth to the Emperor Henry, who had the sovereignty over Rome. 
This year went out Githa, Harold's mother, and the wives of many good men with her, to the flat home, and there abode some time, and so departed, thence over sea to St. Omer's. This Easter came the king to Winchester, and Easter was then on the tenth, before the Calends of April. Soon after this came the Lady Matilda hither to this land, and Archbishop Eldred hallowed her to Queen at Westminster on Whit Sunday. Then it was told the king, that the people in the north had gathered themselves together, and would stand against him if he came. Whereupon he went to Nottingham, and wrought there a castle, and so advanced to York, and there wrought two castles, and the same at Lincoln, and everywhere in that quarter. Then Earl Gus Patrick and the best men went into Scotland. Amidst this came one of Harold's sons from Ireland with a naval force into the mouth of the Avon unawares, and plundered soon over all that quarter, whence they went to Bristol, and would have stormed the town, but the people bravely withstood them. When they could gain nothing from the town, they went to their ships with the booty which they had acquired by plunder, and then they advanced upon Somersetshire, and there went up, and Ednoth, master of the horse, fought with them, but he was their slain, and many good men on either side, and those that were left departed thence. A.D. 1068. This year King William gave Earl Robert the Earldom over Northumberland, but the landsmen attacked him in the town of Durham, and slew him, and nine hundred men with him. Soon afterwards Edgar Etheling came with all the Northumbrians to York, and the townsmen made a treaty with him, but King William came from the south unawares on them with a large army, and put them to flight, and slew on the spot those who could not escape, which were many hundred men, and plundered the town. St. Peter's Minster he made a profanation, and all other places also he despoiled and trampled upon, and the Etheling went back again to Scotland. After this came Harold's sons from Ireland, about midsummer, with sixty-four ships into the mouth of the Taft, where they unwarily landed, and Earl Brion came unawares against them with a large army, and fought with them, and slew there all the best men that were in the fleet, and the others, being small forces, escaped to the ships, and Harold's sons went back to Ireland again. A.D. 1069. This year died Aldred, Archbishop of York, and he is there buried, at his see. He died on the day of Protus and Hyacinthus, having held the see with much dignity ten years wanting only fifteen weeks. Soon after this came from Denmark three of the sons of King Swain with two hundred and forty ships, together with Earl Esborne and Earl Thurkill, into the Humber, where they were met by the child Edgar, and Earl Walthief, and Merle Swain, and Earl Gusbatric with the Northumbrians, and all the landsmen, riding and marching full merrily with an immense army, and so all unanimously advanced to York, where they stormed and demolished the castle, and won innumerable treasures therein, slew there many hundreds of Frenchmen, and led many with them to the ships, but, ere that the shipmen came thither, the Frenchmen had burned the city, and also the holy minster of St. Peter had they entirely plundered, and destroyed with fire. When the king heard this, then went he northward with all the force that he could collect, despoiling and laying waste the shire withal, whilst the fleet lay all the winter in the Humber, where the king could not come at them. The king was in York on Christmas Day, and so all the winter on land, and came to Winchester at Easter. Bishop Egelric, who was at Peterborough, was this year betrayed, and led to Westminster, and his brother Egelwine was outlawed. This year also died Brand, abbot of Peterborough, on the 5th, before the Calends of December. A.D. 1070. This year Landfrank, who was abbot of Cannes, came to England, and after a few days he became Archbishop of Canterbury. He was invested on the 4th, before the Calends of September in his own seat by eight bishops, his suffragans. The others, who were not there, by messengers and by letter declared why they could not be there. The same year Thomas, who was chosen Bishop of York, came to Canterbury, to be invested there after the ancient custom. But when Landfrank craved confirmation of his obedience with an oath, he refused, and said, that he ought not to do it. Whereupon Archbishop Landfrank was wroth, and bade the bishops, who were come thither by Archbishop Landfrank's command to do the service, and all the monks to unrobe themselves. And they by his order so did. Thomas, therefore, for the time, departed without consecration. Soon after this, it happened that the Archbishop Landfrank went to Rome, and Thomas with him. When they came thither, and had spoken about other things concerning which they wished to speak, then began Thomas's speech, how he came to Canterbury, and how the archbishop required obedience of him with an oath, but he declined it. 
Then began the Archbishop Landfranc to show with clear distinction that what he craved he craved by right, and with strong arguments he confirmed the same before the Pope Alexander and before all the council that was collected there, and so they went home. After this came Thomas to Canterbury, and all that the Archbishop required of him he humbly fulfilled, and afterwards received consecration. This year Earl Walthief agreed with the king, but in the Lent of the same year the king ordered all the monasteries in England to be plundered. In the same year came King Swain from Denmark into the Humber, and the landsmen came to meet him, and made a treaty with him, thinking that he would overrun the land. Then came into Ely Christian, the Danish bishop, and Earl Osborne, and the Danish domestics with them, and the English people from all the Funlands came to them, supposing that they should win all that land. Then the monks of Peterborough heard say that their own men would plunder the minster, namely Hereward and his gang, because they understood that the king had given the abbacy to a French abbot, whose name was Thorold, that he was a very stern man, and was then come into Stamford with all his Frenchmen. Now there was a churchwarden, whose name was Aware, who took away by night all that he could, testaments, mass hackles, cantel copes, and reefs, and such other small things, whatsoever he could, and went early, before day, to the abbot Thorold, telling him that he sought his protection, and informing him how the outlaws were coming to Peterborough, and that he did all by advice of the monks. Early in the morning came all the outlaws with many ships, resolving to enter the minster, but the monks withstood, so that they could not come in. Then they laid on fire, and burned all the houses of the monks, and all the town except one house. Then came they in through fire at the bull hithe gate, where the monks met them, and besought peace of them. But they regarded nothing. They went into the minster, climbed up to the holy rood, took away the diadem from our Lord's head, all of pure gold, and seized the bracket that was underneath his feet, which was all of red gold. They climbed up to the steeple, brought down the table that was hid there, which was all of gold and silver, seized two golden shrines, and nine of silver, and took away fifteen large crucifixes, of gold and of silver, in short, they seized there so much gold and silver, and so many treasures, in money, in raiment, and in books, as no man could tell another, and said, that they did it from their attachment to the minster. Afterwards they went to their ships, proceeded to Ely, and deposited there all the treasure. The Danes, believing that they should overcome the Frenchmen, drove out all the monks, leaving their only one, whose name was Leofwine Lang, who lay sick in the infirmary. Then came Abbot Thorold and eight times twenty Frenchmen with him, all full armed. When he came thither, he found all within and without consumed by fire, except the church alone, but the outlaws were all with the fleet, knowing that he would come thither. This was done on the fourth day, before the Nones of June. The two kings, William and Swain, were now reconciled, and the Danes went out of Ely with all the aforesaid treasure, and carried it away with them. But when they came into the middle of the sea, there came a violent storm, and dispersed all the ships wherein the treasures were. Some went to Norway, some to Ireland, some to Denmark. All that reached the latter consisted of the table, and some shrines, and some crucifixes, and many of the other treasures, which they brought to a king's town, called, and deposited it all there in the church. Afterwards through their own carelessness, and through their drunkenness, in one night the church and all that was therein was consumed by fire. Thus was the minster of Peterborough burned and plundered. Almighty God have mercy on it through his great goodness. Thus came the abbot Thorold to Peterborough, and the monks too returned, and performed the service of Christ in the church, which had before stood a full week without any kind of rite. When Bishop Aylrick heard it, he excommunicated all the men who that evil deed had done. There was a great famine this year, and in the summer came the fleet in the north from the Humber into the Thames, and lay there two nights, and made afterwards for Denmark. Earl Baldwin also died, and his son Arnulf succeeded to the earldom. Earl William, in conjunction with the King of the Franks, was to be his guardian, but Earl Robert came and slew his kinsman Arnulf and the Earl, put the King to flight, and slew many thousands of his men. A.D. 1071 This year Earl Edwin and Earl Morker fled out and roamed at random in woods and in fields. Then went Earl Morker to Ely by ship, but Earl Edwin was treacherously slain by his own men. Then came Bishop Aylwine and Seward Barn, and many hundred men with them, into Ely. When King William heard that, then ordered he out a naval force and land force, and beset the land all about, and wrought a bridge, and went in, and the naval force at the same time on the seaside. 
and the outlaws then all surrendered, that was, Bishop Aylwine, and Earl Morker, and all that were with them, except Hereward alone, and all those that would join him, whom he led out triumphantly. And the king took their ships, and weapons, and many treasures, and all the men he disposed of as he thought proper. Bishop Aylwine he sent to Abingdon, where he died in the beginning of the winter. A.D. 1072 this year King William led a naval force and a land force to Scotland, and beset that land on the seaside with ships, whilst he led his land force in at the Tweed, but he found nothing there of any value. King Malcolm, however, came, and made peace with King William, and gave hostages, and became his man, whereupon the king returned home with all his force. This year died Bishop Aylric. He had been invested Bishop of York, but that see was unjustly taken from him, and he then had the bishopric of Durham given him, which he held as long as he chose, but resigned it afterwards, and retired to Peterborough Minster, where he abode twelve years. After that King William won England, then took he him from Peterborough, and sent him to Westminster, where he died on the Ides of October, and he is there buried, within the Minster, in the porch of St. Nicholas. A.D. 1073 this year led King William an army, English and French, over sea, and won the district of Maine, which the English very much injured by destroying the vineyards, burning the towns, and spoiling the land. But they subdued it all into the hand of King William, and afterwards returned home to England. A.D. 1074 this year King William went over sea to Normandy, and child Edgar came from Flanders into Scotland on St. Grimbald's Mass Day, where King Malcolm and his sister Margaret received him with much pomp. At the same time sent Philip, the King of France, a letter to him, bidding him to come to him, and he would give him the castle of Montreal, that he might afterwards daily annoy his enemies. What then? King Malcolm and his sister Margaret gave him and his men great presents, and many treasures, in skins ornamented with purple, in pelisses made of marten skins, of grey skins, and of ermine skins, in pauls, and in vessels of gold and silver, and conducted him and his crew with great pomp from his territory. But in their voyage evil befell them, for when they were out at sea, there came upon them such rough weather, and the stormy sea and the strong wind drove them so violently on the shore, that all their ships burst, and they also themselves came with difficulty to the land. Their treasure was nearly all lost, and some of his men also were taken by the French, but he himself and his best men returned again to Scotland, some roughly travelling on foot, and some miserably mounted. Then King Malcolm advised him to send to King William over sea, to request his friendship, which he did, and the king gave it him, and sent after him. Again, therefore, King Malcolm and his sister gave him and all his men numberless treasures, and again conducted him very magnificently from their territory. The Sheriff of York came to meet him at Durham, and went all the way with him, ordering meat and fodder to be found for him at every castle to which they came, until they came over sea to the king. Then King William received him with much pomp, and he was there afterwards in his court, enjoying such rights as he confirmed to him by law. A.D. 1075 This year King William gave Earl Ralph the daughter of William Fitzosborne to wife. This same Ralph was British on his mother's side, but his father, whose name was also Ralph, was English and born in Norfolk. The king therefore gave his son the earldom of Norfolk and Suffolk, and he then led the bride to Norwich. There was that bride ale, the source of man's bale. There was Earl Roger, and Earl Walthief, and bishops, and abbots, who there resolved, that they would drive the king out of the realm of England. But it was soon told the king in Normandy how it was determined. It was Earl Roger and Earl Ralph who were the authors of that plot, and who enticed the Britons to them, and sent eastward to Denmark after a fleet to assist them. Roger went westward to his earldom, and collected his people there, to the king's annoyance, as he thought, but it was to the great disadvantage of himself. He was however prevented. Ralph also in his earldom would go forth with his people, but the castlemen that were in England, and also the people of the land, came against him, and prevented him from doing anything. He escaped however to the ships at Norwich and his wife was in the castle, which she held until peace was made with her, when she went out of England, with all her men who wished to join her. The king afterwards came to England, and seized Earl Roger, his relative, and put him in prison. And Earl Walthief went over sea, and berated himself, but he asked forgiveness, and proffered gifts of ransom. The king, however, let him off lightly, until he came to England, when he had him seized. 
Soon after that came east from Denmark 200 ships, wherein were two captains, Knut Swainson and Earl Hacko, but they durst not maintain a fight with King William. They went rather to York, and broke into St. Peter's Minster, and took therein much treasure, and so went away. They made for Flanders oversea, but they all perished who were privy to that design, that was, the son of Earl Hacko, and many others with him. This year died the Lady Egitha, who was the relict of King Edward, seven nights before Christmas, at Winchester, and the king caused her to be brought to Westminster with great pomp, and he laid her with King Edward, her lord. And the king was then at Westminster, at midwinter, where all the Britons were condemned who were at the Brydale at Norwich. Some were punished with blindness, some were driven from the land, and some were towed to Scandinavia. So were the traitors of King William subdued. A.D. 1076. This year died Swain, king of Denmark, and Harold his son took to the kingdom. And the king gave the abbacy of Westminster to Abbot Vitalis, who had been abbot of Bernay. This year also was Earl Walthief beheaded at Winchester, on the mass day of St. Petronilla, and his body was carried to Croyland, where he lies buried. King William now went over sea, and led his army to Brittany, and beset the castle of Dole, but the Bretons defended it, until the king came from France, whereupon William departed thence, having lost their both men and horses, and many of his treasures. A.D. 1077. This year were reconciled the king of the Franks and William, king of England. But it continued only a little while. This year was London burned, one night before the Assumption of St. Mary, so terribly as it never was before, since it was built. This year the moon was eclipsed three nights before Candlemas, and in the same year died Aylwi, the prudent abbot of Evesham, on the fourteenth day before the Calends of March, on the mass day of St. Juliana, and Walter was appointed abbot in his stead, and Bishop Herman also died, on the tenth day before the Calends of March, who was bishop in Berkshire, and in Wiltshire, and in Dorsetshire. This year also King Malcolm won the mother of Malslave and all his best men, and all his treasures, and his cattle, and he himself not easily escaped. This year also was the dry summer, and wildfire came upon many shires, and burned many towns, and also many cities were ruined thereby. A.D. 1079. This year Robert, the son of King William, deserted from his father to his uncle Robert in Flanders, because his father would not let him govern his earldom in Normandy, which he himself, and also King Philip with his permission, had given him. The best men that were in the land also had sworn oaths of allegiance to him, and taken him for their lord. This year, therefore, Robert fought with his father, without Normandy, by a castle called Gerbroy, and wounded him in the hand, and his horse, that he sat upon, was killed under him, and he that brought him another was killed there right with a dart. That was Tookie Wigged son. Many were there slain, and also taken. His son William too was there wounded, but Robert returned to Flanders. We will not here, however, record any more injury that he did his father. This year came King Malcolm from Scotland into England, betwixt the two festivals of St. Mary, with a large army, which plundered Northumberland till it came to the Tyne, and slew many hundreds of men, and carried home much coin, and treasure, and men in captivity. A.D. 1080. This year was Bishop Walker slain in Durham, at a council, and an hundred men with him, French and Flemish. He himself was born in Lorraine. This did the Northumbrians in the month of May. A.D. 1081. This year the king led an army into Wales, and there freed many hundreds of men. A.D. 1082. This year the king seized Bishop Odo, and this year also was a great famine. A.D. 1083. This year arose the tumult at Glastonbury betwixt the abbot Thurston and his monks. It proceeded first from the abbot's want of wisdom that he misgoverned his monks in many things. But the monks meant well to him, and told him that he should govern them rightly, and love them, and they would be faithful and obedient to him. The abbot, however, would hear nothing of this, but evil entreated them, and threatened them worse. One day the abbot went into the chapter house, and spoke against the monks, and attempted to mislead them, and sent after some laymen, and they came full armed into the chapter house upon the monks. Then were the monks very much afraid of them, and wist not what they were to do, but they shot forward, and some ran into the church, and locked the doors after them. 
but they followed them into the minster and resolved to drag them out so that they durst not go out. A rueful thing happened on that day. The Frenchmen broke into the choir and hurled their weapons toward the altar where the monks were and some of the knights went upon the upper floor and shot their arrows downward incessantly toward the sanctuary so that on the crucifix that stood above the altar they stuck many arrows. And the wretched monks lay about the altar, and some crept under, and earnestly called upon God, imploring his mercy, since they could not obtain any at the hands of men. What can we say, but that they continued to shoot their arrows, whilst the others broke down the doors, and came in, and slew some of the monks to death, and wounded many therein, so that the blood came from the altar upon the steps, and from the steps on the floor. Three there were slain to death, and eighteen wounded. And in this same year departed Matilda, Queen of King William, on the day after All Hallow Mass. And in the same year also, after midwinter, the king ordained a large and heavy contribution over all England, that was, upon each height of land, two and seventy pence. A.D. 1084. In this year died Wolfwald, abbot of Chertsey, on the thirteenth day before the Calends of May. A.D. 1085. In this year men reported, and of a truth asserted, that Nut, king of Denmark, son of King Swain, was coming hitherward, and was resolved to win this land, with the assistance of Robert, Earl of Flanders, for Nut had Robert's daughter. When William, king of England, who was then resident in Normandy, for he had both England and Normandy, understood this, he went into England with so large an army of horse and foot, from France and Brittany, as never before sought this land, so that men wondered how this land could feed all that force. But the king left the army to shift for themselves through all this land amongst his subjects, who fed them, each according to his quota of land. Men suffered much distress this year, and the king caused the land to be laid waste about the sea coast, that, if his foes came up, they might not have anything on which they could very readily seize. But when the king understood of a truth that his foes were impeded, and could not further their expedition, then let he some of the army go to their own land, but some he held in this land over the winter. Then, at the midwinter, was the king in Gloucester with his council, and held there his court five days. And afterwards the archbishop and clergy had a synod three days. There was Mauritius chosen bishop of London, William of Norfolk, and Robert of Cheshire. These were all the king's clerks. After this had the king a large meeting, and very deep consultation with his council, about this land, how it was occupied, and by what sort of men. Then sent he his men over all England into each shire, commissioning them to find out how many hundreds of hides were in the shire, what land the king himself had, and what stock upon the land, or what dues he ought to have by the year from the shire. Also he commissioned them to record in writing how much land his archbishops had, and his diocesan bishops, and his abbots, and his earls, and though I may be prolix and tedious, what, or how much, each man had, who was an occupier of land in England either in land or in stock, and how much money it were worth. So very narrowly, indeed, did he commission them to trace it out, that there was not one single hide, nor a yard of land, nay, moreover, it is shameful to tell, though he thought it no shame to do it, not even an ox, nor a cow, nor a swine was there left, that was not set down in his writ. And all the recorded particulars were afterwards brought to him. A.D. 1086 This year the king bare his crown, and held his court, in Winchester at Easter, and he so arranged, that he was by the Pentecost at Westminster, and dubbed his son Henry a knight there. Afterwards he moved about so that he came by Lammas to Sarum, where he was met by his counsellors, and all the landsmen that were of any account over all England became this man's vassals as they were, and they all bowed themselves before him, and became his men, and swore him oaths of allegiance that they would against all other men be faithful to him. Thence he proceeded into the Isle of Wight, because he wished to go into Normandy, and so he afterwards did, though he first did according to his custom, he collected a very large sum from his people, wherever he could make any demand, whether with justice or otherwise. Then he went into Normandy, and Edgar Etheling, the relation of King Edward, revolted from him, for he received not much honour from him, but may the Almighty God give him honour hereafter. And Christina, the sister of the Etheling, went into the monastery of Rumsey, and received the Holy Veil. And the same year there was a very heavy season, and a swingful and sorrowful year in England, in murrain of cattle, and corn and fruits were at a stand, and so much untowardness in the weather, as a man may not easily think, so tremendous was the thunder and lightning, that it killed many men, and it continually grew worse and worse with men. May God Almighty better it whenever it be His will. 
AD 1087. After the birth of our Lord and Savior Christ, 1087 winters, in the one and twentieth year after William began to govern and direct England, as God granted him, was a very heavy and pestilent season in this land. Such a sickness came on men, that full nigh every other man was in the worst disorder, that is, in the diarrhea, and that so dreadfully, that many men died in the disorder. Afterwards came, through the badness of the weather as we before mentioned, so great a famine over all England, that many hundreds of men died a miserable death through hunger. Alas! How wretched and how rueful a time was there! When the poor wretches lay full nigh driven to death prematurely, and afterwards came sharp hunger, and dispatched them withal. Who will not be penetrated with grief at such a season? Or who is so hard-hearted as not to weep at such misfortune? Yet such things happen for folk's sins, that they will not love God and righteousness. So it was in those days, that little righteousness was in this land with any men but with the monks alone, wherever they fared well. The king and the headmen loved much, and overmuch, covetousness in gold and in silver, and recked not how sinfully it was got, provided it came to them. The king let his land at as high a rate as he possibly could, then came some other person, and bade more than the former one gave, and the king let it to the men that bade him more. Then came the third, and bade yet more, and the king let it to hand to the men that bade him most of all, and he recked not how very sinfully the stewards got it of wretched men, nor how many unlawful deeds they did, but the more men spake about right law, the more unlawfully they acted. They erected unjust tolls, and many other unjust things they did, that are difficult to reckon. Also in the same year, before harvest, the holy minster of St. Paul, the Episcopal See in London, was completely burned, with many other minsters, and the greatest part, and the richest of the whole city. So also, about the same time, full nigh each headport in all England was entirely burned. Alas! Rueful and woeful was the fate of the year that brought forth so many misfortunes. In the same year, also, before the Assumption of St. Mary, King William went from Normandy into France with an army, and made war upon his own lord Philip, the king, and slew many of his men, and burned the town of Mant, and all the holy minsters that were in the town, and two holy men that served God, leading the life of Anacorets, were burned therein. This being thus done, King William returned to Normandy. Rueful was the thing he did, but a more rueful him befell. How more rueful! He fell sick, and it dreadfully ailed him. What shall I say? Sharp death, that passes by neither rich men nor poor, seized him also. He died in Normandy, on the next day after the nativity of St. Mary, and he was buried at Ken in St. Stephen's minster, which he had formerly reared, and afterwards endowed with manifold gifts. Alas! How false and how uncertain is this world's wheel! He that was before a rich king, and lord of many lands, had not then of all his land more than a space of seven feet. And he that was while a man shrouded in gold and gems, lay there covered with mould. He left behind him three sons, the eldest, called Robert, who was earl in Normandy after him, the second, called William, who wore the crown after him in England, and the third, called Henry, to whom his father bequeathed immense treasure. If any person wishes to know what kind of man he was, or what honour he had, or of how many lands he was lord, then will we write about him as well as we understand him, we who often looked upon him, and lived sometime in his court. This King William then that we speak about was a very wise man, and very rich, more splendid and powerful than any of his predecessors were. He was mild to the good men that loved God, and beyond all measure severe to the men that gainsayed his will. On that same spot where God granted him that he should gain England, he reared a mighty minster, and set monks therein, and well endowed it. In his days was the great monastery in Canterbury built, and also very many others over all England. This land was moreover well filled with monks, who modelled their lives after the rule of St. Benedict. But such was the state of Christianity in his time, that each man followed what belonged to his profession he that would. He was also very dignified. Thrice he bare his crown each year, as oft as he was in England. At Easter he bare it in Winchester, at Pentecost in Westminster, at Midwinter in Gloucester. And then were with him all the rich men over all England, archbishops and diocesan bishops, abbots and earls, thanes and knights. So very stern was he also and hot, that no man durst do anything against his will. 
He had earls in his custody, who acted against his will. Bishops he hurled from their bishoprics, and abbots from their abbacies, and thanes into prison. At length he spared not his own brother Odo, who was a very rich bishop in Normandy. At Bayer was his episcopal stall, and he was the foremost man of all to aggrandize the king. He had an earldom in England, and when the king was in Normandy, then was he the mightiest man in this land. Him he confined in prison. But amongst other things is not to be forgotten that good peace that he made in this land, so that a man of any account might go over his kingdom unhurt with his bosom full of gold. No man durst slay another, had he never so much evil done to the other, and if any churl lay with a woman against her will, he soon lost the limb that he played with. He truly reigned over England, and by his capacity so thoroughly surveyed it, that there was not a hide of land in England that he wist not who had it, or what it was worth, and afterwards set it down in his book. The land of the Britons was in his power, and he wrought castles therein, and ruled Anglesey withal. So also he subdued Scotland by his great strength. As to Normandy, that was his native land, but he reigned also over the earldom called Maine, and if he might have yet lived two years more, he would have won Ireland by his valour, and without any weapons. Assuredly in his time had men much distress, and very many sorrows. Castles he let men build, and miserably swink the poor. The king himself was so very rigid, and extorted from his subjects many marks of gold, and many hundred pounds of silver, which he took of his people, for little need, by right and by unright. He was fallen into covetousness, and greediness he loved withal. He made many deer parks, and he established laws therewith, so that whosoever slew a hart, or a hind, should be deprived of his eyesight. As he forbade men to kill the hearts, so also the boars, and he loved the tall deer as if he were their father. Likewise he decreed by the hares, that they should go free. His rich men bemoaned it, and the poor men shuddered at it. But he was so stern, that he wrecked not the hatred of them all, for they must follow with all the king's will, if they would live, or have land, or possessions, or even his peace. Alas! that any man should presume so to puff himself up, and boast o'er all men. May the Almighty God show mercy to his soul, and grant him forgiveness of his sins. These things have we written concerning him, both good and evil, that men may choose the good after their goodness, and flee from the evil withal, and go in the way that leadeth us to the kingdom of heaven. Many things may we write that were done in the same year. So it was in Denmark, that the Danes, a nation that was formerly accounted the truest of all, were turned aside to the greatest untruth, and to the greatest treachery that ever could be. They chose and bowed to King Nut, and swore him oaths, and afterwards dastardly slew him in a church. It happened also in Spain, that the heathens went and made inroads upon the Christians, and reduced much of the country to their dominion. But the king of the Christians, Alfonso by name, sent everywhere into each land, and desired assistance. And they came to his support from every land that was Christian, and they went and slew or drove away all the heathen folk, and won their land again, through God's assistance. In this land also, in the same year, died many rich men, Stigand, Bishop of Chichester, and the Abbot of St. Augustine, and the Abbot of Bath, and the Abbot of Pershore, and the Lord of them all, William, King of England, that we spoke of before. After his death his son, called William also as the father, took to the kingdom, and was blessed to king by Archbishop Landfrank at Westminster three days ere Michaelmas Day. And all the men in England submitted to him, and swore oaths to him. This being thus done, the king went to Winchester, and opened the treasure house, and the treasures that his father had gathered, in gold, and in silver, and in vases, and in pauls, and in gems, and in many other valuable things that are difficult to enumerate. Then the king did as his father bade him ere he was dead, he there distributed treasures for his father's soul to each monastery that was in England, to some ten marks of gold, to some six, to each upland church sixty pence and into each shire were sent a hundred pounds of money to distribute amongst poor men for his soul. And ere he departed, he bade that they should release all the men that were in prison under his power. And the king was on the midwinter in London. A.D. 1088. In this year was this land much stirred, and filled with great treachery, so that the richest Frenchmen that were in this land would betray their lord the king, and would have his brother Robert King, who was earl in Normandy. In this design was engaged first Bishop Odo, and Bishop Gosforth, and William, Bishop of Durham. 
So well did the king by the bishop, Odo, that all England fared according to his counsel, and as he would. And the bishop thought to do by him as Judas Iscariot did by our Lord. And Earl Roger was also of this faction, and much people was with him all Frenchmen. This conspiracy was formed in Lent. As soon as Easter came, then went they forth, and harrowed, and burned, and wasted the king's farms, and they despoiled the lands of all the men that were in the king's service. And they each of them went to his castle, and manned it, and provisioned it as well as they could. Bishop Gosforth, and Robert the Peacebreaker, went to Bristol, and plundered it, and brought the spoil to the castle. Afterwards they went out of the castle, and plundered Bath, and all the land thereabout, and all the honour of Berkeley they laid waste. And the men that eldest were of Hereford, and all the shire forthwith, and the men of Shropshire, with much people of Wales, came and plundered and burned in Worcestershire, until they came to the city itself, which it was their design to set on fire, and then to rifle the minster, and win the king's castle to their hands. The worthy Bishop Wolfston, seeing these things, was much agitated in his mind, because to him was bade ken the custody of the castle. Nevertheless his hired men went out of the castle with few attendants, and, through God's mercy and the bishop's merits, slew or took five hundred men, and put all the others to flight. The bishop of Durham did all the harm that he could over all by the north. Roger was the name of one of them, who leaped into the castle at Norwich, and did yet the worst of all over all that land. Hugh also was one, who did nothing better either in Leicestershire or in Northamptonshire. The Bishop Odo being one, though of the same family from which the king himself was descended, went into Kent to his earldom, and greatly despoiled it, and having laid waste the lands of the king and of the archbishop withal, he brought the booty into his castle at Rochester. When the king understood all these things, and what treachery they were employing against him, then was he in his mind much agitated. He then sent after Englishmen, described to them his need, earnestly requested their support, and promised them the best laws that ever before were in this land, each unright guild he forbade, and restored to the men their woods and chases. But it stood no while. The Englishmen, however, went to the assistance of the king, their lord. They advanced toward Rochester, with a view to get possession of the Bishop Odo, for they thought, if they had him who was at first the head of the conspiracy, they might the better get possession of all the others. They came then to the castle at Tunbridge, and there were in the castle the knights of Bishop Odo, and many others who were resolved to hold it against the king. But the Englishmen advanced, and broke into the castle, and the men that were therein agreed with the king. The king with his army went toward Rochester. And they supposed that the bishop was therein, but it was made known to the king that the bishop was gone to the castle at Pavencia. And the king with his army went after, and beset the castle about with a very large force full six weeks. During this time the Earl of Normandy, Robert, the king's brother, gathered a very considerable force, and thought to win England with the support of those men that were in this land against the king. And he sent some of his men to this land, intending to come himself after. But the Englishmen that guarded the sea lighted upon some of the men, and slew them, and drowned more than any man could tell. When provisions afterwards failed those within the castle, they earnestly besought peace, and gave themselves up to the king, and the bishop swore that he would depart out of England, and no more come on this land, unless the king sent after him, and that he would give up the castle at Rochester. Just as the bishop was going with an intention to give up the castle, and the king had sent his men with him, then arose the men that were in the castle, and took the bishop and the king's men, and put them into prison. In the castle were some very good knights, Eustace the Young, and the three sons of Earl Roger, and all the best-born men that were in this land or in Normandy. When the king understood this thing, then went he after with the army that he had there, and sent over all England. And bade that each man that was faithful should come to him, French and English, from seaport and from upland. Then came to him much people, and he went to Rochester, and beset the castle, until they that were therein agreed, and gave up the castle. The bishop Odo with the men that were in the castle went over sea, and the bishop thus abandoned the dignity that he had in this land. The king afterwards sent an army to Durham, and allowed it to beset the castle, and the bishop agreed, and gave up the castle, and relinquished his bishopric, and went to Normandy. Many Frenchmen also abandoned their lands, and went over sea, and the king gave their lands to the men that were faithful to him. AD 1089 in this year, the venerable father and favor of monks, Archbishop Landfrank, departed this life, but we hope that he has gone to the heavenly kingdom. 
There was also over all England much earth stirring on the third day before the Ides of August, and it was a very late year in corn, and in every kind of fruits, so that many men reaped their corn about Martinus, and yet later. A.D. 1090. In Didion 13. These things thus done, just as we have already said above, by the king, and by his brother, and by this man, the king was considering how he might wreak his vengeance on his brother Robert, harass him most, and win Normandy of him. And indeed through his craft, or through bribery, he got possession of the castle at St. Valery, and the haven, and so he got possession of that at Albemarle. And therein he set his knights, and they did harm to the land in harrowing and burning. After this he got possession of more castles in the land, and therein lodged his horsemen. When the Earl of Normandy, Robert, understood that his sworn men deceived him, and gave up their castles to do him harm, then sent he to his lord, Philip, king of the Franks, and he came to Normandy with a large army, and the king and the earl with an immense force beset the castle about, wherein were the men of the king of England. But the king William of England sent to Philip, king of the Franks, and he for his love, or for his great treasure, abandoned thus his subject the earl Robert and his land, and returned again to France, and let them so remain. And in the midst of these things this land was much oppressed by unlawful exactions and by many other misfortunes. A.D. 1091. In this year, the King William held his court at Christmas in Westminster, and thereafter at Candlemas he went, for the annoyance of his brother, out of England into Normandy. Whilst he was there, their reconciliation took place, on the condition, that the Earl put into his hands Festchamp, and the Earldom of O, and Cherbourg, and in addition to this, that the King's men should be secure in the castles that they had won against the will of the Earl and the king in return promised him those many castles that their father had formerly won, and also to reduce those that had revolted from the earl, also all that his father had there beyond, except those that he had then given the king, and that all those that in England before for the earl had lost their land should have it again by this treaty, and that the earl should have in England just so much as was specified in this agreement. And if the earl died without a son by lawful wedlock, the king should be heir of all Normandy, and by virtue of this same treaty, if the king died, the earl should be heir of all England. To this treaty swore twelve of the best men of the king's side, and twelve of the earls, though it stood but a little while afterwards. In the midst of this treaty was Edgar Etheling, deprived of the land that the earl had before permitted him to keep in hand, and he went out of Normandy to the king, his sister's husband, in Scotland, and to his sister. Whilst the King William was out of England, the King Malcolm of Scotland came hither into England, and overran a great deal of it, until the good men that governed this land sent an army against him and repulsed him. When the King William in Normandy heard this, then prepared he his departure, and came to England, and his brother, the Earl Robert, with him, and he soon issued an order to collect a force both naval and military, but the naval force, ere it could come to Scotland, perished almost miserably, a few days before St. Michael's, Massachusetts and the king and his brother proceeded with the land force, but when the king Malcolm heard that they were resolved to seek him with an army, he went with his force out of Scotland into Lothain in England, and there abode. When the king William came near with his army, then interceded between the Merle Robert and Edgar Etheling, and so made the peace of the kings, that the king Malcolm came to our king, and did homage, promising all such obedience as he formerly paid to his father, and that he confirmed with an oath. And the King William promised him in land and in all things whatever he formerly had under his father. In this settlement was also Edgar Etheling united with the king. And the kings then with much satisfaction departed, yet that stood but a little while. And the Earl Robert tarried here full nigh until Christmas with the king, and during this time found but little of the truth of their agreement, and two days before that tide he took ship in the Isle of Wight and went into Normandy, and Edgar Etheling with him. A.D. 1092. In this year, the King William with a large army went north to Carlisle, and restored the town, and reared the castle, and drove out Dolphin that before governed the land, and set his own men in the castle, and then returned hither southward. And a vast number of rustic people with wives, and with cattle he sent thither, to dwell there in order to till the land. A.D. 1093. In this year, during Lent, was the King William at Gloucester so sick, that he was by all reported dead. And in his illness he made many good promises to lead his own life aright, to grant peace and protection to the churches of God, and never more again with fee to sell, to have none but righteous laws amongst his people. 
the Archbishopric of Canterbury, that before remained in his own hand, he transferred to Anselm, who was before Abbot of Beck, to Robert his Chancellor the Bishopric of Lincoln, and to many minsters he gave land, but that he afterwards took away, when he was better, and annulled all the good laws that he promised us before. Then after this sent the King of Scotland, and demanded the fulfilment of the treaty that was promised him. And the King William cited him to Gloucester, and sent him hostages to Scotland, and Edgar Etheling, afterwards, and the men returned, that brought him with great dignity to the king. But when he came to the king, he could not be considered worthy either of our king's speech, or of the conditions that were formerly promised him. For this reason therefore they parted with great dissatisfaction, and the King Malcolm returned to Scotland. And soon after he came home, he gathered his army, and came harrowing into England with more hostility than behoved him, and Robert, the Earl of Northumberland, surrounded him unawares with his men, and slew him. Morel of Barnborough slew him, who was the Earl's steward, and a baptismal friend of King Malcolm. With him was also slain Edward his son, who after him should have been king, if he had lived. When the good Queen Margaret heard this, her most beloved lord and son thus betrayed she was in her mind almost distracted to death. She with her priests went to church, and performed her rites, and prayed before God, that she might give up the ghost. And the Scots then chose to Fenal to King, Malcolm's brother, and drove out all the English that formerly were with the King Malcolm. When Duncan, King Malcolm's son, heard all that had thus taken place, he was then in the King William's court, because his father had given him as a hostage to our king's father, and so he lived here afterwards, he came to the king, and did such fealty as the king required at his hands, and so with his permission went to Scotland, with all the support that he could get of English and French, and deprived his uncle Dufinal of the kingdom, and was received as king. But the Scots afterwards gathered some force together, and slew full nigh all his men, and he himself with a few made his escape. Afterwards they were reconciled, on the condition that he never again brought into the land English or French. A.D. 1094 This year the King William held his court at Christmas in Gloucester, and messengers came to him thither from his brother Robert of Normandy, who said that his brother renounced all peace and conditions, unless the king would fulfill all that they had stipulated in the treaty, and upon that he called him forsworn and void of truth, unless he adhered to the treaty, or went thither and explained himself there, where the treaty was formerly made, and also sworn. Then went the king to Hastings at Candlemas, and whilst he there abode waiting the weather, he let hallow the minster at Battel, and deprived Herbert Losang, the bishop of Thetford, of his staff, and thereafter about Midland went oversea into Normandy. After he came, thither, he and his brother Robert, the earl, said that they should come together in peace, and so they did, and might be united. Afterwards they came together with the same men that before made the treaty, and also confirmed it by oaths, and all the blame of breaking the treaty they threw upon the king, but he would not confess this, nor even adhere to the treaty, and for this reason they parted with much dissatisfaction. And the king afterwards won the castle at Bears, and took the earl's men therein, some of whom he sent hither to this land. On the other hand the earl, with the assistance of the king of France, won the castle at Argents, and took therein Roger of Poitou, and seven hundred of the king's knights with him, and afterwards that at Hume, and oft readily did either of them burn the towns of the other, and also took men. Then sent the king hither to this land, and ordered twenty thousand Englishmen to be sent out to Normandy to his assistance, but when they came to sea, they then had orders to return, and to pay to the king's behoof the fee that they had taken, which was half a pound each man, and they did so. And the earl after this, with the king of France, and with all that he could gather together, went through the midst of Normandy, towards O, where the king William was, and thought to besiege him within, and so they advanced until they came to Luneville. There was the king of France through cunning turned aside, and so afterwards all the army dispersed. In the midst of these things the king William sent after his brother Henry, who was in the castle at Damfront, but because he could not go through Normandy with security, he sent ships after him, and Hugh, Earl of Chester. When, however, they should have gone towards O where the king was, they went to England, and came up at Hampton, on the eve of the Feast of All Saints, and here afterwards abode, and at Christmas they were in London. In the same year also the Welshmen gathered themselves together, and with the French that were in Wales, or in the neighbourhood, and had formerly seized their land, stirred up war, and broke into many fastnesses and castles, and slew many men. And when their followers had increased, they divided themselves into larger parties. With some part of them fought Hugh, Earl of Shropshire, and put them to flight. 
Nevertheless, the other part of them all this year omitted no evil that they could do. This year also the Scots ensnared their king, Duncan, and slew him, and afterwards, the second time, took his uncle Dufinal to king, through whose instruction and advice he was betrayed to death. A.D. 1095 In this year was the King William the first four days of Christmas at Wits End, and after the fourth day came hither, and landed at Dover. And Henry, the king's brother, abode in this land until Lent, and then went overseas to Normandy, with much treasure, on the king's behalf, against their brother, Earl Robert, and frequently fought against the earl, and did him much harm, both in land and in men. And then at Easter held the king his court in Winchester, and the Earl Robert of Northumberland would not come to court. And the king was much stirred to anger with him for this, and sent to him, and bade him harshly, if he would be worthy of protection, that he would come to court at Pentecost. In this year was Easter on the eighth day before the Calends of April, and upon Easter, on the night of the Feast of St. Ambrose, that is, the second before the Nones of April, nearly over all this land, and almost all the night, numerous and manifold stars were seen to fall from heaven, not by one or two, but so thick in succession, that no man could tell it. Hereafter at Pentecost was the king at Windsor, and all his council with him, except the Earl of Northumberland, for the king would neither give him hostages, nor own upon truth, that he might come and go with security. And the king therefore ordered his army, and went against the Earl to Northumberland, and soon after he came thither, he won many, and nearly all the best of the Earl's clan in a fortress, and put them into custody, and the castle at Tynemouth he beset until he won it, and the Earl's brother therein, and all that were with him, and afterwards went to Bamborough, and beset the Earl therein. But when the king saw that he could not win it, then ordered he his men to make a castle before Bamborough, and called it in his speech Malviazin, that is in English, evil neighbor and he fortified it strongly with his men, and afterwards went southward. Then, soon after that the king was gone south, went the earl one night out of Bamborough towards Tynemouth, but they that were in the new castle were aware of him, and went after him, and fought him, and wounded him, and afterwards took him. And of those that were with him some they slew, and some they took alive. Among these things it was made known to the king, that the Welsh men in Wales had broken into a castle called Montgomery, and slain the men of Earl Hugo, that should have held it. He therefore gave orders to levy another force immediately, and after Michaelmas went into Wales, and shifted his forces, and went through all that land, so that the army came all together by all saints to Snowdon. But the Welsh always went before into the mountains and the moors, that no man could come to them. The king then went homeward, for he saw that he could do no more there this winter. When the king came home again, he gave orders to take the Earl Robert of Northumberland, and lead him to Bamborough, and put out both his eyes, unless they that were therein would give up the castle. His wife held it, and Morel who was steward, and also his relative. Through this was the castle then given up, and Morel was then in the king's court, and through him were many both of the clergy and laity surrendered, who with their counsels had conspired against the king. The king had before this time commanded some to be brought into prison, and afterwards had it very strictly proclaimed over all this country, that all who held land of the king, as they wished to be considered worthy of protection, should come to court at the time appointed. And the king commanded that the Earl Robert should be led to Windsor, and there held in the castle. Also in the same year, against Easter, came the Pope's nuncio hither to this land. This was Bishop Walter, a man of very good life, of the town of Albano, and upon the day of Pentecost on the behalf of Pope Urban he gave Archbishop Anselm his Paul, and he received him at his archiepiscopal stall in Canterbury. And Bishop Walter remained afterwards in this land a great part of the year, and men then sent by him the Romescot, which they had not done for many years before. This same year also the weather was very unseasonable, in consequence of which throughout all this land were all the fruits of the earth reduced to a moderate crop. A.D. 1096 In this year held the King William his court at Christmas in Windsor, and William Bishop of Durham died there on New Year's Day, and on the octave of the Epiphany was the King and all his counselors at Salisbury. There Geoffrey Baynard challenged William of O, the King's relative, maintaining that he had been in the conspiracy against the King. And he fought with him, and overcame him in single combat, and after he was overcome, the king gave orders to put out his eyes, and afterwards to emasculate him, and his steward, William by name, who was the son of his stepmother, the king commanded to be hanged on a gibbet. Then was also Iota, Earl of Champagne, the king's son-in-law, and many others, deprived of their lands, whilst some were led to London, and there killed. 
This year also, at Easter, there was a very great stir through all this nation and many others, on account of Urban, who was declared Pope, though he had nothing of a see at Rome. And an immense multitude went forth, with their wives and children, that they might make war upon the heathens. Through this expedition were the king and his brother, Earl Robert, reconciled, so that the king went over sea, and purchased all Normandy of him, on condition that they should be united. And the earl afterwards departed, and with him the earl of Flanders, and the earl of Boulogne, and also many other men of rank. And the earl Robert, and they that went with him, passed the winter in Apulia, but of the people that went by Hungary many thousands miserably perished there and by the way. And many dragged themselves home rueful and hunger-bitten on the approach of winter. This was a very heavy-timed year through all England, both through the manifold tributes, and also through the very heavy-timed hunger that severely oppressed this earth in the course of the year. In this year also the principal men who held this land frequently sent forces into Wales, and many men thereby grievously afflicted, producing no results but destruction of men and waste of money. A.D. 1097 in this year was the King William at Christmas in Normandy, and afterwards against Easter he embarked for this land, for that he thought to hold his court at Winchester, but he was weatherbound until Easter Eve, when he first landed at Arundel, and for this reason held his court at Windsor. And thereafter with a great army he went into Wales, and quickly penetrated that land with his forces, through some of the Welsh who were come to him, and were his guides, and he remained in that country from midsummer nearly until August, and suffered much loss there in men and in horses, and also in many other things. The Welshmen, after they had revolted from the king, chose the many elders from themselves, one of whom was called Cadwen, who was the worthiest of them, being brother's son to King Griffin. And when the king saw that he could do nothing in furtherance of his will, he returned again into this land, and soon after that he let his men build castles on the borders. Then upon the feast of St. Michael, the fourth day before the Nones of October, appeared an uncommon star, shining in the evening, and soon hastening to set. It was seen southwest, and the ray that stood off from it was thought very long, shining southeast. And it appeared on this wise nearly all the week. Many men supposed that it was a comet. Soon after this Archbishop Anselm of Canterbury obtained leave of the king, though it was contrary to the wishes of the king, as men supposed, and went over sea, because he thought that men in this country did little according to right and after his instruction. And the king thereafter upon St. Martin's Mass went over sea into Normandy, but whilst he was waiting for fair weather, his court in the county where they lay, did the most harm that ever court or army could do in a friendly and peaceable land. This was in all things a very heavy-timed year, and beyond measure laborious from badness of weather, both when men attempted to till the land, and afterwards to gather the fruits of their tilth, and from unjust contributions they never rested. Many counties also that were confined to London by work, were grievously oppressed on account of the wall that they were building about the tower, and the bridge that was nearly all afloat, and the work of the King's Hall that they were building at Westminster, and many men perished thereby. Also in the same year soon after Michaelmas when Edgar Etheling with an army through the king's assistance into Scotland, and with hard fighting won that land, and drove out the king Dufnell, and his nephew Edgar, who was son of King Malcolm and of Margaret the Queen, he there appointed king in fealty to the King William, and afterwards again returned to England. A.D. 1098 in this year at Christmas was the King William in Normandy, and Wachelin, Bishop of Winchester, and Baldwin, Abbot of St. Edmunds, within this tide both departed. And in this year also died Turold, Abbot of Peterborough. In the summer of this year also, at Finchamstead in Berkshire, a pool welled with blood, as many true men said that should see it. And Earl Hugh was slain in Anglesey by foreign pirates, and his brother Robert was his heir, as he had settled it before with the king. Before Michaelmas the heaven was of such an hue, as if it were burning, nearly all the night. This was a very troublesome year through manifold impositions, and from the abundant rains, that ceased not all the year, nearly all the tilth in the marshlands perished. A.D. 1099 this year was the King William at midwinter in Normandy, and at Easter came hither to land, and at Pentecost held his court the first time in his new building at Westminster, and there he gave the bishopric of Durham to Ranulf his chaplain, who had long directed and governed his councils over all England. And soon after this he went over sea, and drove the Earl Elias out of Maine, which he reduced under his power, and so by Michaelmas returned to this land. This year also, on the festival of St. Martin, the sea flood sprung up to such a height, and did so much harm, as no man remembered that it ever did before. 
and this was the first day of the new moon. And Osmond, Bishop of Salisbury, died in Advent. A.D. 1100 In this year, the King William held his court at Christmas in Gloucester, and at Easter in Winchester, and at Pentecost in Westminster. And at Pentecost was seen in Berkshire at a certain town blood to well from the earth, as many said that should see it. And thereafter on the morning after Lammas Day was the King William shot in hunting, by an arrow from his own men, and afterwards brought to Winchester, and buried in the cathedral. This was in the thirteenth year after that he assumed the government. He was very harsh and severe over his land and his men, and with all his neighbors, and very formidable, and through the counsels of evil men, that to him were always agreeable, and through his own avarice, he was ever tiring this nation with an army, and with unjust contributions. For in his days all right fell to the ground, and every wrong rose up before God and before the world. God's church he humbled, and all the bishoprics and abbacies, whose elders fell in his days, he either sold in fee, or held in his own hands, and let for a certain sum, because he would be the heir of every man, both of the clergy and laity, so that on the day that he fell he had in his own hands the archbishopric of Canterbury, with the bishopric of Winchester, and that of Salisbury, and eleven abbacies. All let for a sum, and, though I may be tedious, all that was loathsome to God, and righteous men, all that was customary in this land in his time. And for this he was loathed by nearly all his people, and odious to God, as his end testified, for he departed in the midst of his unrighteousness, without any power of repentance or recompense for his deeds. On the Thursday he was slain, and in the morning afterwards buried, and after he was buried, the statesmen that were then nigh at hand, chose his brother Henry to king. And he immediately gave the bishopric of Winchester to William Gifford, and afterwards went to London, and on the Sunday following, before the altar at Westminster, he promised God and all the people, to annul all the unrighteous acts that took place in his brother's time, and to maintain the best laws that were valid in any king's day before him. And after this the Bishop of London, Maurice, consecrated him king, and all in this land submitted to him, and swore oaths, and became his men. And the king, soon after this, by the advice of those that were about him, allowed men to take the Bishop Ranulf of Durham, and bring him into the Tower of London, and hold him there. Then, before Michaelmas, came the Archbishop Anselm of Canterbury hither to this land, as the King Henry, by the advice of his ministers had sent after him, because he had gone out of this land for the great wrongs that the King William did unto him. And soon hereafter the King took him to wife Maud, daughter of Malcolm, King of Scotland, and of Margaret the Good Queen, the relative of King Edward, and of the right royal race of England. And on Martinmas Day she was publicly given to him with much pomp at Westminster, and the Archbishop Anselm wedded her to him, and afterwards consecrated her queen. And the Archbishop Thomas of York soon hereafter died. During the harvest of this same year also came the Earl Robert home into Normandy, and the Earl Robert of Flanders, Eustace, Earl of Boulogne, from Jerusalem. And as soon as the Earl Robert came into Normandy, he was joyfully received by all his people, except those of the castles that were garrisoned with the King Henry's men. Against them he had many contests and struggles. A.D. 1101 In this year at Christmas held the King Henry his court in Westminster and at Easter in Winchester. And soon thereafter were the chief men in this land in a conspiracy against the king, partly from their own great infidelity, and also through the Earl Robert of Normandy, who with hostility aspired to the invasion of this land. And the king afterwards sent ships out to sea, to thwart and impede his brother, but some of them in the time of need fell back, and turned from the king, and surrendered themselves to the Earl Robert. Then at midsummer went the king out to Pevensey with all his force against his brother, and there awaited him. But in the meantime came the Earl Robert up at Portsmouth twelve nights before Lammas, and the king with all his force came against him. But the chief men interceded between them, and settled the brothers on the condition that the king should forgo all that he held by main strength in Normandy against the earl, and that all then in England should have their lands again, who had lost it before through the earl, and Earl Eustace also all his patrimony in this land, and that the Earl Robert every year should receive from England three thousand marks of silver, and particularly, that whichever of the brothers should survive the other, he should be heir of all England and also of Normandy, except the deceased left an heir by lawful wedlock. And this twelve men of the highest rank on either side then confirmed with an oath. And the earl afterwards remained in this land till after Michaelmas, and his men did much harm wherever they went, the while that the earl continued in this land. 
This year, also the Bishop Ranulf at Candlemas burst out of the Tower of London by night, where he was in confinement, and went into Normandy, through whose contrivance and instigation mostly the Earl Robert this year sought this land with hostility. A.D. 1102 In this year at the Nativity was the King Henry at Westminster and at Easter in Winchester. And soon thereafter arose a dissension between the king and the Earl Robert of Belezum, who held in this land the earldom of Shrewsbury, that his father, Earl Roger, had before, and much territory therewith both on the side and beyond the sea. And the king went and beset the castle at Arundel, but when he could not easily win it, he allowed men to make castles before it, and filled them with his men, and afterwards with all his army he went to Bridge North, and there continued until he had the castle, and deprived the Earl Robert of his land, and stripped him of all that he had in England. And the earl accordingly went over sea, and the army afterwards returned home. Then was the king thereafter by Michaelmas at Westminster, and all the principal men in this land, clerk and laity. And the archbishop Anselm held a synod of clergy, and there they established many canons that belonged to Christianity. And many, both French and English, were there deprived of their staves and dignity, which they either obtained with injustice or enjoyed with dishonor. And in the same year, in the week of the Feast of Pentecost, there came thieves, some from Auvergne, some from France, and some from Flanders, and broke into the minster of Peterborough, and therein seized much property in gold and in silver, namely, roods, and chalices, and candlesticks. A.D. 1103 In this year, at midwinter, was the King Henry at Westminster. And soon afterwards departed the Bishop William Gifford out of this land, because he would not against right accept his hood at the hands of the Archbishop Gerard of York. And then at Easter held the King his court at Winchester, and afterwards went the Archbishop Anselm from Canterbury to Rome, as was agreed between him and the King. This year also came the Earl Robert of Normandy to speak with the King in this land, and ere he departed hence he forgave the King Henry the three thousand marks that he was bound by treaty to give him each year. In this year also at Hampstead in Berkshire was seen blood, to rise, from the earth. This was a very calamitous year in this land, through manifold impositions, and through murren of cattle, and deficiency of produce, not only in corn, but in every kind of fruit. Also in the morning, upon the mass day of St. Lawrence, the wind did so much harm here on land to all fruits, as no man remembered that ever any did before. In this same year died Matthias, abbot of Peterborough, who lived no longer than one year after he was abbot. After Michaelmas, on the twelfth day before the Calends of November, he was in full procession received as abbot, and on the same day of the next year he was dead at Gloucester, and there buried. A.D. 1104 In this year at Christmas held the King Henry his court at Westminster, and at Easter in Winchester, and at Pentecost again at Westminster. This year was the first day of Pentecost on the Nones of June, and on the Tuesday following were seen four circles at midday about the sun, of a white hue, each described under the other as if they were measured. All that saw it wondered, for they never remembered such before. Afterwards were reconciled the Earl Robert of Normandy and Robert de Belezum, whom the King Henry had before deprived of his lands, and driven from England, and through their reconciliation the King of England and the Earl of Normandy became adversaries and the king sent his folk over sea into Normandy, and the headmen in that land received them, and with treachery to their lord, the earl, lodged them in their castles, whence they committed many outrages on the earl in plundering and burning. This year also William, Earl of Moreton, went from this land into Normandy, but after he was gone he acted against the king, because the king stripped and deprived him of all that he had here in this land. It is not easy to describe the misery of this land, which it was suffering through various and manifold wrongs and impositions, that never failed nor ceased, and wheresoever the king went, there was full license given to his company to harrow and oppress his wretched people, and in the midst thereof happened oftentimes burnings and manslaughter. All this was done to the displeasure of God, and to the vexation of this unhappy people. A.D. 1105 in this year, on the Nativity, held the King Henry his court at Windsor, and afterwards in Lent he went over sea into Normandy against his brother Earl Robert. And whilst he remained there he one of his brother Ken and Byer, and almost all the castles and the chief men in that land were subdued. And afterwards by harvest he returned hither again, and that which he had won in Normandy remained afterwards in peace and subjection to him, except that which was anywhere near the Earl William of Mortain. This he often demanded as strongly as he could for the loss of his land in this country. 
and then before Christmas came Robert de Belezem hither to the king. This was a very calamitous year in this land, through loss of fruits, and through the manifold contributions that never ceased before the king went over, to Normandy, or while he was there, or after he came back again. A.D. 1106 In this year was the King Henry on the nativity at Westminster, and there held his court, and at that season Robert de Belezem went unreconciled from the king out of his land into Normandy. Hereafter before Lent was the king at Northampton, and the Earl Robert his brother came thither from Normandy to him, and because the king would not give him back that which he had taken from him in Normandy, they parted in hostility, and the Earl soon went over sea back again. In the first week of Lent, on the Friday, which was the fourteenth before the Calends of March, in the evening appeared an unusual star, and a long time afterwards was seen every evening shining a while. The star appeared in the southwest, it was thought little and dark, but the train of light which stood from it was very bright, and appeared like an immense beam shining northeast, and some evening this beam was seen as if it were moving itself forwards against the star. Some said that they saw more of such unusual stars at this time, but we do not write more fully about it, because we saw it not ourselves. On the night preceding the Lord's Supper, that is, the Thursday before Easter, were seen two moons in the heavens before day, the one in the east, and the other in the west, both full, and it was the fourteenth day of the moon. At Easter was the king at Bath, and at Pentecost at Salisbury, because he would not hold his court when he was beyond the sea. After this, and before August, went the king over sea into Normandy, and almost all that were in that land submitted to his will, except Robert de Belezem and the Earl of Mortain, and a few others of the principal persons who he had held with the Earl of Normandy. For this reason the king afterwards advanced with an army, and beset a castle of the Earl of Mortain, called Tenor Kibri. Whilst the king beset the castle, came the Earl Robert of Normandy on Michaelmas Eve against the king with his army, and with him Robert of Belezem and William, Earl of Mortain, and all that would be with them, but the strength and the victory were the king's. There was the Earl of Normandy taken, and the Earl of Mortain, and Robert of Studeville, and afterwards sent to England, and put into custody. Robert of Belezem was there put to flight, and William Crispin was taken, and many others forthwith. Edgar Atheling, who a little before had gone over from the king to the earl, was also there taken, whom the king afterwards let go unpunished. Then went the king over all that was in Normandy, and settled it according to his will and discretion. This year also were heavy and sinful conflicts between the emperor of Saxony and his son, and in the midst of these conflicts the father fell, and the son succeeded to the empire. A.D. 1107 in this year at Christmas was the King Henry in Normandy, and, having disposed and settled that land to his will, he afterwards came hither in Lent, and at Easter held his court at Windsor, and at Pentecost in Westminster. And afterwards in the beginning of August he was again at Westminster, and there gave away and settled the bishoprics and abbacies that either in England or in Normandy were without elders and pastors. Of these there were so many, that there was no man who remembered that ever so many together were given away before. And on this same occasion, among the others who accepted abbacies, Ernulf, who before was prior at Canterbury, succeeded to the abbacy in Peterborough. This was nearly about seven years after the King Henry undertook the kingdom and the one and fortieth year since the Franks governed this land. Many said that they saw sundry tokens in the moon this year, and its orb increasing and decreasing contrary to nature. This year died Maurice, Bishop of London, and Robert, Abbot of St. Edmundsbury, and Richard, Abbot of Ely. This year also died the King Edgar in Scotland, on the Ides of January, and Alexander his brother succeeded to the kingdom, as the King Henry granted him. A.D. 1108 In this year was the King Henry on the Nativity at Westminster, and at Easter at Winchester, and by Pentecost at Westminster again. After this, before August, he went into Normandy. And Philip, the king of France, died on the nones of August, and his son Louis succeeded to the kingdom. And there were afterwards many struggles between the king of France and the king of England, while the latter remained in Normandy. In this year also died the Archbishop Gerard of York, before Pentecost, and Thomas was afterwards appointed thereto. A.D. 1109 in this year was the King Henry at Christmas and at Easter in Normandy, and before Pentecost he came to this land, and held his court at Westminster. There were the conditions fully settled, and the oaths sworn, for giving his daughter to the Emperor. 
This year were very frequent storms of thunder and very tremendous, and the Archbishop Anselm of Canterbury died on the 11th day before the Calends of April and the first day of Easter was on Latania Major. A.D. 1110 in this year held the King Henry his court at Christmas in Westminster, and at Easter he was at Marlborough, and at Pentecost he held his court for the first time in New Windsor. This year before Lent the king sent his daughter with manifold treasures over sea, and gave her to the emperor. On the fifth night in the month of May appeared the moon shining bright in the evening, and afterwards by little and little its light diminished, so that, as soon as night came, it was so completely extinguished withal, that neither light, nor orb, nor anything at all of it was seen. And so it continued nearly until day, and then appeared shining full and bright. It was this same day a fortnight old. All the night was the firmament very clear, and the stars over all the heavens shining very bright. And the fruits of the trees were this night sorely nipped by frost. Afterwards, in the month of June, appeared a star northeast, and its train stood before it towards the southwest. Thus was it seen many nights, and as the night advanced, when it rose higher, it was seen going backward toward the northwest. This year were deprived of their lands Philip of Breos, and William Mallet, and William Baynard. This year also died Earl Elias, who held Maine in Fetale of King Henry, and after his death the Earl of Anjou succeeded to it, and held it against the king. This was a very calamitous year in this land, through the contributions which the king received for his daughter's portion, and through the badness of the weather, by which the fruits of the earth were very much marred, and the produce of the trees over all this land almost entirely perished. This year men began first to work at the new minster at Chertsey. A.D. 1111. This year the King Henry bare not his crown at Christmas, nor at Easter, nor at Pentecost. And in August he went over sea into Normandy, on account of the broils that some had with him by the confines of France, and chiefly on account of the Earl of Anjou, who held Maine against him. And after he came over thither, many conspiracies, and burnings, and harrowings, did they between them. In this year died the Earl Robert of Flanders, and his son Baldwin succeeded thereto. This year was the winter very long, and the season heavy and severe, and through that were the fruits of the earth sorely marred, and there was the greatest murren of cattle that any man could remember. A.D. 1112 All this year remained the King Henry in Normandy on account of the broils that he had with France, and with the Earl of Anjou, who held Maine against him. And whilst he was there, he deprived of their lands the Earl of Evreux, and William Crispin, and drove them out of Normandy. To Philip of Breos he restored his land, who had been before deprived of it, and Robert of Belezem he suffered to be seized, and put into prison. This was a very good year, and very fruitful, in wood and in field, but it was a very heavy time and sorrowful, through a severe mortality amongst men. A.D. 1113 in this year was the King Henry on the Nativity and at Easter and at Pentecost in Normandy. And after that, in the summer, he sent hither Robert of Belezem into the castle at Wareham, and himself soon afterwards came hither to this land. A.D. 1114 In this year held the King Henry his court on the Nativity at Windsor, and held no other court afterwards during the year. And at midsummer he went with an army into Wales, and the Welsh came and made peace with the king. And he let men build castles therein. And thereafter, in September, he went over sea into Normandy. This year, in the latter end of May, was seen an uncommon star with a long train, shining many nights. In this year also was so great an ebb of the tide everywhere in one day, as no man remembered before, so that men went riding and walking over the Thames eastward of London Bridge. This year were very violent winds in the month of October, but it was a moderately rough in the night of the octave of St. Martin, and that was everywhere manifest both in town and country. In this year also the king gave the Archbishopric of Canterbury to Ralph, who was before Bishop of Rochester, and Thomas, Archbishop of York, died, and Terstein succeeded thereto, who was before the king's chaplain. About the same time went the king toward the sea, and was desirous of going over, but the weather prevented him, then meanwhile sent he his writ after the abbot Arnulf of Peterborough, and bade that he should come to him quickly, for that he wished to speak with him on an interesting subject. When he came to him, he appointed him to the bishopric of Rochester, and the archbishops and bishops and all the nobility that were in England coincided with the king. And he long withstood, but it availed nothing. 
and the king bade the archbishop that he should lead him to Canterbury and consecrate him bishop whether he would or not. This was done in the town called Bourne on the seventeenth day before the Calends of October. When the monks of Peterborough heard of this, they felt greater sorrow than they had ever experienced before, because he was a very good and amiable man, and did much good within and without whilst he abode there. God Almighty abide ever with him. Soon after this gave the king the abbacy to a monk of size, whose name was John, through the entreaty of the Archbishop of Canterbury. And soon after this the king and the Archbishop of Canterbury sent him to Rome after the Archbishop's Paul, and a monk also with him, whose name was Warner, and the Archdeacon John, the nephew of the Archbishop. And they sped well there. This was done on the seventh day before the Calends of October, in the town that is a clept Roner. And this same day went the king on board ship at Portsmouth. A.D. 1115 this year was the King Henry on the Nativity in Normandy. And whilst he was there, he contrived that all the headmen in Normandy did homage and fealty to his son William, whom he had by his queen. And after this, in the month of July, he returned to this land. This year was the winter so severe, with snow and with frost, that no man who was then living ever remembered one more severe, in consequence of which there was great destruction of cattle. During this year the Pope Pascalis sent the Paul into this land to Ralph, Archbishop of Canterbury, and he received it with great worship at his archiepiscopal stall in Canterbury. It was brought hither from Rome by Abbot Anselm, who was the nephew of Archbishop Anselm, and the Abbot John of Peterborough. A.D. 1116 In this year was the King Henry on the Nativity at St. Albans, where he permitted the consecration of that monastery, and at Easter he was at Odeham. And there was also this year a very heavy-timed winter, strong and long, for cattle and for all things. And the king soon after Easter went over sea into Normandy. And there were many conspiracies and robberies, and castles taken betwixt France and Normandy. Most of this disturbance was because the King Henry assisted his nephew, Theobald de Blois, who was engaged in a war against his lord, Louis, the King of France. This was a very vexatious and destructive year with respect to the fruits of the earth, through the immoderate rains that fell soon after the beginning of August, harassing and perplexing men till Candlemas Day. This year also was so deficient in mast, that there was never heard such in all this land or in Wales. This land and nation were also this year oft and sorely swinked by the guilds which the king took both within the boroughs and without. In the same year was consumed by fire the whole monastery of Peterborough, and all the buildings, except the chapter house and the dormitory, and therewith also all the greater part of the town. All this happened on a Friday, which was the second day before the knowns of August. A.D. 1117 All this year remained the King Henry, in Normandy, on account of the hostility of the King of France and his other neighbours. And in the summer came the King of France and the Earl of Flanders with him with an army into Normandy. And having stayed there in one night, they returned again in the morning without fighting. But Normandy was very much afflicted both by the exactions and by the armies which the King Henry collected against them. This nation also was severely oppressed through the same means, namely, through manifold exactions. This year also, in the night of the Calends of December, were a moderate storms with thunder, and lightning, and rain, and hail. And in the night of the third day before the Ides of December was the moon, during a long time of the night, as if covered with blood, and afterwards eclipsed. Also in the night of the seventeenth day before the Calends of January, was the heaven seen very red, as if it were burning. And on the octave of St. John the Evangelist was the great earthquake in Lombardy, from the shock of which many minsters, and towers, and houses fell, and did much harm to men. This was a very blighted year in corn, through the rains that scarcely ceased for nearly all the year. And the abbot Gilbert of Westminster died on the eighth day before the Ides of December, and Ferrets, abbot of Abingdon, on the seventh day before the Calends of March. And in this same year. A.D. 1118. All this year abode the King Henry in Normandy on account of the war of the King of France and the Earl of Anjou and the Earl of Flanders. And the Earl of Flanders was wounded in Normandy and went so wounded into Flanders. By this war was the King much exhausted and he was a great loser both in land and money. 
and his own men grieved him most, who often from him turned, and betrayed him, and going over to his foes surrendered to them their castles, to the injury and disappointment of the king. All this England dearly bought through the manifold guilds that all this year abetted not. This year, in the week of the Epiphany, there was one evening a great deal of lightning, and thereafter unusual thunder. And the Queen Matilda died at Westminster on the Calends of May, and there was buried. And the Earl Robert of Mellent died also this year. In this year also, on the feast of St. Thomas, was so very immoderately violent a wind, that no man who was then living ever remembered any greater, and that was everywhere seen both in houses and also in trees. This year also died Pope Pascalis, and John of Gaeta succeeded to the Pope Dom, whose other name was Gelasius. A.D. 1119 All this year continued the King Henry in Normandy, and he was greatly perplexed by the hostility of the King of France, and also of his own men, who with treachery deserted from him and oft readily betrayed him, until the two kings came together in Normandy with their forces. There was the King of France put to flight, and all his best men taken. And afterwards many of King Henry's men returned to him, and accorded with him, who were before, with their castellans, against him. And some of the castles he took by main strength. This year went William, the son of King Henry and Queen Matilda, into Normandy to his father, and there was given to him, and wedded to wife, the daughter of the Earl of Anjou. On the eve of the Mass of St. Michael was much earth heaving in some places in this land, though most of all in Gloucestershire and in Worcestershire. In this same year died the Pope Gelasius, on the side of the Alps, and was buried at Clugny. And after him the Archbishop of Vienna was chosen Pope, whose name was Calixtus. He afterwards, on the festival of St. Luke the Evangelist, came into France to Reims, and there held a council. And the Archbishop Turston of York went thither, and, because that he against right, and against the archiepiscopal stall in Canterbury, and against the king's will, received his hood at the hands of the Pope, the king interdicted him from all return to England. And thus he lost his archbishopric, and with the Pope went towards Rome. In this year also died the Earl Baldwin of Flanders of the wounds that he received in Normandy. And after him succeeded to the earldom Charles, the son of his uncle by the father's side, who was son of Nut, the holy king of Denmark. A.D. 1120 This year were reconciled the king of England and the king of France, and after their reconciliation all the king Henry's own men accorded with him in Normandy, as well as the earl of Flanders and the earl of Ponthieu. From this time forward the King Henry settled his castles and his land in Normandy after his will, and so before Advent came to this land. And in this expedition were drawn the king's two sons, William and Richard, and Richard, Earl of Chester, and Otwell his brother, and very many of the king's household, stewards, and chamberlains, and butlers. And men of various abodes, and with them a countless multitude of very incomparable folk besides. So was their death to their friends in a twofold respect, one, that they so suddenly lost this life, the other, that few of their bodies were found anywhere afterwards. This year came that light to the sepulchre of the Lord in Jerusalem twice, once at Easter, and the other on the Assumption of St. Mary, as credible persons said who came thence. And the Archbishop Turston of York was through the Pope reconciled with the King, and came to this land, and recovered his bishopric, though it was very undesirable to the Archbishop of Canterbury. A.D. 1121. This year was the King Henry at Christmas at Brampton, and afterwards, before Candlemas, at Windsor was given him to wife Athelis, soon afterwards consecrated queen, who was daughter of the Duke of Louvain. And the moon was eclipsed in the night of the Nones of April, being a fortnight old. And the king was at Easter at Berkeley, and after that at Pentecost he held a full court at Westminster, and afterwards in the summer went with an army into Wales. And the Welsh came against him, and after the king's will they accorded with him. This year came the Earl of Anjou from Jerusalem into his land, and soon after sent hither to fetch his daughter, who had been given to wife to William, the king's son. And in the night of the eve of Natalie's Domini was a very violent wind over all this land, and that was in many things evidently seen. A.D. 1122 In this year was the King Henry at Christmas in Norwich, and at Easter in Northampton. 
and in the Lenttide before that, the town of Gloucester was on fire, the while that the monks were singing their mass, and the deacon had begun the gospel, Preaterians Jesus, at that very moment came the fire from the upper part of the steeple, and burned all the minster, and all the treasures that were there within, except a few books, and three mass hackles. That was on the eighth day, before the Ides of Marcia. And thereafter, the Tuesday after Palm Sunday, was a very violent wind on the eleventh day before the Calends of April, after which came many tokens far and wide in England, and many spectres were both seen and heard. And the eighth night before the Calends of August was a very violent earthquake over all Somersetshire and in Gloucestershire. Soon after, on the sixth day before the Ides of September, which was on the festival of St. Mary, there was a very violent wind from the fore part of the day to the depth of the night. This same year died Ralph, the Archbishop of Canterbury, that was on the thirteenth day before the Calends of November. After this there were many shipmen on the sea, and on fresh water, who said, that they saw on the northeast, level with the earth, a fire huge and broad, which anon waxed in length up to the welkin, and the welkin undid itself in four parts, and fought against it, as if it would quench it, and the fire waxed nevertheless up to the heaven. The fire they saw in the day dawn, and it lasted until it was light over all. That was on the seventh day, before the Ides of December. A.D. 1123. In this year was the King Henry, at Christmas tide at Dunstable, and there came to him the ambassadors of the Earl of Anjou. And thence he went to Woodstock, and his bishops and his whole court with him. Then did it betide on a Wednesday, which was on the fourth day before the Ides of January, that the king rode in his dear fold, the Bishop Roger of Salisbury on one side of him, and the Bishop Robert Bloat of Lincoln on the other side of him. And they rode there talking together. Then sank down the Bishop of Lincoln, and said to the king, Lord King, I die. And the king alighted down from his horse, and lifted him betwixt his arms, and let men bear him home to his inn. There he was soon dead, and they carried him to Lincoln with great worship, and buried him before the altar of St. Mary. And the Bishop of Chester, whose name was Robert Pexith, buried him. Soon after this sent the king his writ over all England, and bade all his bishops and his abbots and his thanes, that they should come to his Wittenwood on Candlemas Day at Gloucester to meet him, and they did so. When they were there gathered together, then the king bade them, that they should choose for themselves an archbishop of Canterbury, whomsoever they would, and he would confirm it. Then spoke the bishops among themselves, and said that they never more would have a man of the monastic order as archbishop over them. And they went all in a body to the king, and earnestly requested that they might choose from the clerical order whomsoever they would for archbishop. And the king granted it to them. This was all concerted before, through the bishop of Salisbury, and through the bishop of Lincoln ere he was dead, for that they never loved the rule of monks, but were ever against monks and their rule. And the prior, and the monks of Canterbury, and all the other persons of the monastic order that were there, withstood it full two days, but it availed not, for the bishop of Salisbury was strong, and wielded all England, and opposed them with all his power and might. Then chose they a clerk, named William of Kerboyle. He was canon of a monastery called Chiche. And they brought him before the king, and the king gave him the archbishopric. And all the bishops received him, but almost all the monks, and the earls, and the thanes that were there, protested against him. About the same time departed the earl's messengers in hostility from the king, reckless of his favor. During the same time came a legate from Rome, whose name was Henry. He was abbot of the monastery of St. John of Angeli, and he came after the Rome Scot. And he said to the king, that it was against right that men should set a clerk over monks, and therefore they had chosen an archbishop before in their chapter after right. But the king would not undo it, for the love of the bishop of Salisbury. Then went the archbishop, soon after this, to Canterbury, and was there received, though it was against their will, and he was there soon blessed to bishop by the bishop of London, and the bishop Ernulf of Rochester, and the bishop William Gerard of Winchester, and the bishop Bernard of Wales, and the bishop Roger of Salisbury. Then, early in Lent, went the archbishop to Rome, after his Paul, and with him went the bishop Bernard of Wales, and Suffered, abbot of Glastonbury, and Anselm, abbot of St. Edmundsbury, and John, archdeacon of Canterbury, and Gifford, who was the king's court chaplain. At the same time went the archbishop Thurston of York to Rome, through the behest of the Pope, and came thither three days ere the archbishop of Canterbury came, and was there received with much worship. 
Then came the Archbishop of Canterbury and was their full seven nights ere they could come to a conference with the Pope. That was, because the Pope was made to understand that he had obtained the archbishopric against the monks of the Minster and against Rite. But that overcame Rome, which overcometh all the world, that is, gold and silver. And the Pope softened and gave him his pall. And the Archbishop of York swore him subjection in all those things which the Pope enjoined him by the heads of St. Peter and St. Paul, and the Pope then sent him home with his blessing. The while that the Archbishop was out of the land, the King gave the Bishopric of Bath to the Queen's Chancellor, whose name was Godfrey. He was born in Louvain. That was on the Annunciation of St. Mary, at Woodstock. Soon after this went the King to Winchester, and was all Easter tied there. And the while that he was there, gave he the bishopric of Lincoln to a clerk hight Alexander. He was nephew of the bishop of Salisbury. This he did all for the love of the bishop. Then went the king thence to Portsmouth, and lay there all over Pentecost week. Then, as soon as he had a fair wind, he went over into Normandy, and meanwhile committed all England to the guidance and government of the bishop Roger of Salisbury. Then was the king all this year in Normandy and much hostility arose betwixt him and his thanes, so that the Earl Walleram of Mellent, and Hamalric, and Hugh of Montfort, and William of Romari, and many others, went from him, and held their castles against him. And the king strongly opposed them, and the same year he won of Walleram his castle of Pontodomer, and of Hugh that of Montfort, and ever after, the longer he stayed, the better he sped. This same year, ere the Bishop of Lincoln came to his bishopric, almost all the borough of Lincoln was burned, and numberless folks, men and women, were consumed, and so much harm was there done as no man could describe to another. That was on the fourteenth day, before the Calends of June. A.D. 1124. All this year was the King Henry in Normandy. That was for the great hostility that he had with the King Louis of France, and with the Earl of Anjou, and most of all with his own men. Then it happened, on the day of the Annunciation of St. Mary, that the Earl Walleram of Mellent went from one of his castles called Belmont to another called Waddeville. With him went the steward of the King of France, Amalric, and Hugh the son of Gervis, and Hugh of Montfort, and many other good knights. Then came against them the king's knights from all the castles that were thereabout, and fought with them, and put them to flight, and took the Earl Walleram, and Hugh, the son of Gervis, and Hugh of Montfort, and five and twenty other knights, and brought them to the king. And the king committed the Earl Walleram, and Hugh, the son of Gervis, to close custody in the castle at Rouen, but Hugh of Montfort he sent to England, and ordered him to be secured with strong bonds in the castle at Gloucester and of the others as many as he chose he sent north and south to his castles in captivity. After this went the king, and won all the castles of the Earl Walleram that were in Normandy, and all the others that his enemies held against him. All this hostility was on account of the son of the Earl Robert of Normandy, named William. This same William had taken to wife the younger daughter of Fulk, Earl of Anjou, and for this reason the King of France and all the earls held with him, and all the rich men, and said that the King held his brother Robert wrongfully in captivity, and drove his son William unjustly out of Normandy. This same year were the seasons very unfavorable in England for corn and all fruits, so that between Christmas and Candlemas men sold the acre seed of wheat, that is two seed lips, for six shillings, and the barley, that is three seed lips, for six shillings also, and the acre seed of oats, that is four seed lips, for four shillings. That was because that corn was scarce, and the penny was so adulterated, that a man who had a pound at a market could not exchange twelve pence thereof for anything. In the same year died the blessed Bishop Ernulf of Rochester, who before was abbot of Peterborough. That was on the Ides of March. And after this died the King Alexander of Scotland, on the ninth day before the Calends of May. And David his brother, who was Earl of Northamptonshire, succeeded to the kingdom, and had both together, the kingdom of Scotland and the earldom in England. And on the nineteenth day before the Calends of January died the Pope of Rome, whose name was Calixtus, and Honorius succeeded to the Pope Dom. This same year, after St. Andrew's Mass, and before Christmas, held Ralph Bassett and the King's Thanes a Wittenwood in Leicestershire, at Hunkatho, and there hanged more thieves than ever were known before, that is, in a little while, four and forty men altogether, and despoiled six men of their eyes and of their testicles. 
Many true men said that there were several who suffered very unjustly, but our Lord God Almighty, who seeth and knoweth every secret, seeth also that the wretched people are oppressed with all unrighteousness. First they are bereaved of their property, and then they are slain. Full heavy year was this. The man that had any property was bereaved of it by violent guilds and violent moots. The man that had not was starved with hunger. A.D. 1125 In this year sent the King Henry, before Christmas, from Normandy to England, and bade that all the mintmen that were in England should be mutilated in their limbs, that was, that they should lose each of them the right hand, and their testicles beneath. This was because the man that had a pound could not lay out a penny at a market. And the Bishop Roger of Salisbury sent over all England, and bade them all that they should come to Winchester at Christmas. When they came thither, then were they taken one by one, and deprived each of the right hand and the testicles beneath. All this was done within the twelfth night. And that was all in perfect justice, because that they had undone all the land with the great quantity of base coin that they all bought. In this same year sent the Pope of Rome to this land a cardinal, named John of Crema. He came first to the king in Normandy, and the king received him with much worship. He betook himself then to the Archbishop William of Canterbury, and he led him to Canterbury, and he was there received with great veneration, and in solemn procession. And he sang the High Mass on Easter Day at the altar of Christ. Afterwards he went over all England, to all the bishoprics and abbacies that were in this land, and in all he was received with respect. And all gave him many and rich gifts. And afterwards he held his council in London full three days, on the Nativity of St. Mary in September, with archbishops, and diocesan bishops, and abbots, the learned and the lewd, and enjoined there the same laws that Archbishop Anselm had formerly enjoined, and many more, though it availed little. Thence he went overseas soon after Michaelmas, and so to Rome, and, with him, the Archbishop William of Canterbury, and the Archbishop Thurston of York, and the Bishop Alexander of Lincoln, and the Bishop J. of Lothian, and the Abbot G. of St. Albans, and were there received by the Pope Honorius with great respect, and continued there all the winter. In the same year was so great a flood on St. Lawrence's Day, that many towns and men were overwhelmed, and bridges broken down, and corn and meadows spoiled withal, and hunger and qualm in men and in cattle, and in all fruits such unseasonableness as was not known for many years before. And this same year died the abbot John of Peterborough, on the second day before the Ides of October. A.D. 1126 All this year was the King Henry in Normandy all till after harvest. Then came he to this land, betwixt the nativity of St. Mary and Michaelmas. With him came the queen, and his daughter, whom he had formerly given to the Emperor Henry of Lorraine to wife. And he brought with him the Earl Walleram, and Hugh, the son of Gervis. And the Earl he sent to Bridgenorth in captivity, and thence he sent him afterwards to Wallingford, and Hugh to Windsor, whom he ordered to be kept in strong bonds. Then after Michaelmas came David, the king of the Scots, from Scotland to this land, and the king Henry received him with great worship, and he continued all that year in this land. In this year the king had his brother Robert taken from the bishop Roger of Salisbury, and committed him to his son Robert, Earl of Gloucester, and had him led to Bristol, and there put into the castle. That was all done through his daughter's counsel, and through David, the king of the Scots, her uncle. A.D. 1127 this year held the King Henry his court at Christmas in Windsor. There was David the King of the Scots, and all the headmen that were in England, learned and lewd. And there he engaged the archbishops, and bishops, and abbots, and earls, and all the thanes that were there, to swear England and Normandy after his day into the hands of his daughter Athelicia, who was formerly the wife of the Emperor of Saxony. Afterwards he sent her to Normandy, and with her went her brother Robert, Earl of Gloucester, and Brian, son of the Earl Alan Fergan, and he let her with the son of the Earl of Anjou, whose name was Geoffrey Martel. All the French and English, however, disapproved of this, but the king did it for to have the alliance of the Earl of Anjou, and for to have help against his nephew William. In the Lent tide of the same year was the Earl Charles of Flanders slain in a church, as he lay there and prayed to God, before the altar, in the midst of the Mass, by his own men. And the King of France brought William, the son of the Earl of Normandy, and gave him the earldom, and the people of that land accepted him. This same William had before taken to wife the daughter of the Earl of Anjou, but they were afterwards divorced on the plea of consanguinity. 
This was all through the King Henry of England. Afterwards, took he to wife the sister of the king's wife of France, and for this reason the king gave him the earldom of Flanders. This same year he gave the abbacy of Peterborough to an abbot named Henry of Poitou, who retained in hand his abbacy of St. John of Angeli, but all the archbishops and bishops said that it was against right, and that he could not have two abbacies on hand. But the same Henry gave the king to understand that he had relinquished his abbacy on account of the great hostility that was in the land, and that he did through the council and leave of the Pope of Rome, and through that of the abbot of Clugny, and because he was legate of the Rome Scot. But, nevertheless, it was not so, for he would retain both in hand, and did so as long as God's will was. He was in his clerical state Bishop of Soissons, afterwards Monk of Clugny, and then Prior in the same monastery. Afterwards he became prior of Savigny, and then, because he was a relation of the King of England and of the Earl of Poitou, the Earl gave him the abbacy of St. John's Minster of Angeli. Afterwards, through his great craft, he obtained the Archbishopric of Basankin, and had it in hand three days, after which he justly lost it, because he had before unjustly obtained it. Afterwards he procured the Bishopric of Saints, which was five miles from his abbey that he had full nigh a week in hand, but the abbot of Clugny brought him thence, as he before did from Basankin. Then he bethought him, that, if he could be fast-rooted in England, he might have all his will. Wherefore he besought the king, and said unto him, that he was an old man, a man completely broken, that he could not brook the great injustice and the great hostility that were in their land, and then, by his own endearers, and by those of all his friends, he earnestly and expressly entreated for the abbacy of Peterborough and the king procured it for him, because he was his relation, and because he was the principal person to make oath and bear witness when the son of the Earl of Normandy and the daughter of the Earl of Anjou were divorced on the plea of consanguinity. Thus wretchedly was the abbacy given away, betwixt Christmas and Candlemas, at London, and so he went with the king to Winchester, and thence he came to Peterborough, and there he dwelt right so as a drone doth in a hive. For as the drone fretteth and draggeth from ward all that the bees drag toward, the hive, so did he. All that he might take, within and without, of learned and lewd, so sent he over sea, and no good did there, no good left there. Think no man unworthily that we say not the truth, for it was fully known over all the land, that, as soon as he came thither, which was on the Sunday when men sing exurge quare od etc., immediately after, several persons saw and heard many huntsmen hunting. The hunters were swarthy, and huge, and ugly, and their hounds were all swarthy, and broad-eyed, and ugly. And they rode on swarthy horses, and swarthy bucks. This was seen in the very deerfold in the town of Peterborough, and in all the woods from that same town to Stamford. And the monks heard the horn blow that they blew in the night. Credible men, who watched them in the night, said that they thought there might well be about twenty or thirty horn blowers. This was seen and heard from the time that he came thither, all the Lent tide onward to Easter. This was his entry, of his exit we can as yet say not. God provide. A.D. 1128. All this year was the King Henry in Normandy, on account of the hostility that was between him and his nephew, the Earl of Flanders. But the Earl was wounded in a fight by a swain, and so wounded he went to the monastery of St. Bertin, where he soon became a monk, lived five days afterwards, then died, and was there buried. God honor his soul. That was on the sixth day before the Calends of August. This same year died the Bishop Randolph Passflambert of Durham, and was there buried on the Nones of September. And this same year went the aforesaid Abbot Henry home to his own minster at Poitou by the King's leave. He gave the king to understand that he would withal forego that minster and that land and dwell with him in England and in the monastery of Peterborough. But it was not so nevertheless. He did this because he would be there, through his crafty wiles, were it a twelve-month or more, and come again afterwards. May God Almighty extend his mercy over that wretched place. This same year came from Jerusalem Hugh of the Temple to the king in Normandy, and the king received him with much honor, and gave him rich presents in gold and in silver. And afterwards he sent him into England, and there he was received by all good men, who all gave him presents, and in Scotland also, and by him they sent to Jerusalem much wealth withal in gold and in silver. And he invited folk out to Jerusalem, and there went with him and after him more people than ever did before, since that the first expedition was in the day of Pope Urban. 
though it availed little, for he said, that a mighty war was begun between the Christians and the heathens, but when they came thither, then was it not but leasing. Thus pitifully was all that people swinked. A.D. 1129 In this year sent the king to England after the Earl Walleram and after Hugh, the son of Gervis. And they gave hostages for them. And Hugh went home to his own land in France, but Walleram was left with the king, and the king gave him all his land except his castle alone. Afterwards came the king to England within the harvest, and the earl came with him, and they became as good friends as they were foes before. Soon after, by the king's counsel, and by his leave, sent the Archbishop William of Canterbury over all England, and bade bishops, and abbots, and archdeacons, and all the priors, monks, and canons, that were in all the cells in England, and all who had the care and superintendence of Christianity, that they should all come to London at Michaelmas, and there should speak of all God's rights. When they came thither, then began the mood on Monday, and continued without intermission to the Friday. When it all came forth, then was it all found to be about archdeacons' wives, and about priests' wives, that they should forego them by St. Andrew's Mass, and he who would not do that, should forego his church, and his house, and his home, and never more have any calling thereto. This bade the Archbishop William of Canterbury, and all the diocesan bishops that were then in England, but the king gave them all leave to go home. And so they went home, and all the ordinances amounted to nothing. All held their wives, by the king's leave, as they did before. This same year died the Bishop William Gifford of Winchester, and was there buried, on the eighth day before the Calends of February. And the King Henry gave the bishopric after Michaelmas to the Abbot Henry of Glastonbury, his nephew, and he was consecrated bishop by the Archbishop William of Canterbury on the fifteenth day before the Calends of December. This same year died Pope Honorius. Ere he was well dead, there were chosen two popes. The one was named Peter, who was monk of Clugny, and was born of the richest men of Rome, and with him held those of Rome, and the Duke of Sicily. The other was Gregory, he was a clerk, and was driven out of Rome by the other pope, and by his kinsmen. With him held the Emperor of Saxony, and the King of France, and the King Henry of England, and all those on this side of the Alps. Now is there such division in Christendom as never was before. May Christ consult for his wretched folk. This same year, on the night of the Mass of St. Nicholas, a little before day, there was a great earthquake. A.D. 1130. This year was the Monastery of Canterbury consecrated by the Archbishop William on the fourth day before the Nones of May. There were the bishops John of Rochester, Gilbert Universal of London, Henry of Winchester, Alexander of Lincoln, Roger of Salisbury, Simon of Worcester, Roger of Coventry, Geoffrey of Bath, Everard of Norwich, Sigefrith of Chichester, Bernard of St. David's, Owen of Evreux in Normandy, John of Size. On the fourth day after this was the King Henry in Rochester, when the town was almost consumed by fire, and the Archbishop William consecrated the monastery of St. Andrew, and the aforesaid bishops with him. And the King Henry went over sea into Normandy in harvest. This same year came the Abbot Henry of Angeli after Easter to Peterborough, and said that he had relinquished that monastery with all. After him came the Abbot of Clugny, Peter by name, to England by the King's leave, and was received by all, whithersoever he came, with much respect. To Peterborough he came, and there the Abbot Henry promised him that he would procure him the minster of Peterborough, that it might be subject to Clugny. But it is said in the proverb, The hedge abideth, that acres divideth. May God Almighty frustrate evil designs. Soon after this, went the abbot of Clugny home to his country. This year was Angus slain by the army of the Scots, and there was a great multitude slain with him. There was God's fight sought upon him, for that he was all forsworn. A.D. 1131 this year, after Christmas, on a Monday night, at the first sleep, was the heaven on the northern hemisphere all as if it were burning fire, so that all who saw it were so dismayed as they never were before. That was on the third day, before the Ides of January. This same year was so great a murrain of cattle as never was before in the memory of men over all England. That was in neat cattle and in swine, so that in a town where there were ten ploughs going, or twelve, there was not left one, and the man that had two hundred or three hundred swine had not one left. Afterwards perished the hen fowls, then shortened the flesh meat, and the cheese, and the butter. May God better it when it shall be his will. 
and the King Henry came home to England before harvest after the Mass of St. Peter ad Vincula. This same year went the Abbot Henry, before Easter, from Peterborough overseas to Normandy, and there spoke with the king, and told him that the Abbot of Clugny had desired him to come to him, and resigned to him the Abbacy of Angeli, after which he would go home by his leave. And so he went home to his own minster, and there remained even to Midsummer Day. And the next day after the festival of St. John chose the monks and abbot of themselves, brought him into the church in procession, sang Te Deum Laudamus, rang the bells, set him on the abbot's throne, did him all homage, as they should do their abbot, and the earl, and all the headmen, and the monks of the minster, drove the other abbot Henry out of the monastery. And they had need, for in five and twenty winters had they never hailed one good day. Here failed him all his mighty crafts. Now it behoved him, that he crope in his skin into every corner, if peradventure there were any unrusty wrench, whereby he might yet once more betray Christ and all Christian people. Then retired he into Clugny, where he was held so fast, that he could not move east or west. The abbot of Clugny said that they had lost St. John's Minster through him, and through his great sottishness. Then could he not better recompense them, but he promised them, and swore oaths on the Holy Cross, that if he might go to England he should get them the Minster of Peterborough, so that he should set there the prior of Clugny, with a churchwarden, a treasurer, and a sacristan, and all the things that were within the Minster and without, he should procure for them. Thus he departed into France, and there remained all that year. Christ provide for the wretched monks of Peterborough, and for that wretched place. Now do they need the help of Christ and of all Christian folk. A.D. 1132 This year came King Henry to this land. Then came Abbot Henry, and betrayed the monks of Peterborough to the king, because he would subject that minster to Clugny, so that the king was well nigh entrapped, and sent after the monks. But through the grace of God, and through the Bishop of Salisbury, and the Bishop of Lincoln, and the other rich men that were there, the king knew that he proceeded with treachery. When he no more could do, then would he that his nephew should be abbot of Peterborough. But Christ forbade. Not very long after this was it that the king sent after him, and made him give up the abbey of Peterborough, and go out of the land. And the king gave the abbacy to a prior of St. Neots, called Martin, who came on St. Peter's Mass Day with great pomp into the minster. A.D. 1135 in this year went the King Henry over sea at the Lammas, and the next day, as he lay asleep on ship, the day darkened over all lands, and the sun was all as it were a three-night old moon, and the stars about him at midday. Men were very much astonished and terrified, and said that a great event should come hereafter. So it did, for that same year was the King dead, the next day after St. Andrew's Mass Day, in Normandy. Then was there soon tribulation in the land, for every man that might, soon robbed another. Then his sons and his friends took his body, and brought it to England, and buried it at Reading. A good man he was, and there was great dread of him. No man durst do wrong with another in his time. Peace he made for man and beast. Whoso bear his burthen of gold and silver, durst no man say aught to him but good. Meanwhile was his nephew come to England, Stephen de Blois. He came to London, and the people of London received him, and sent after the Archbishop William Kerboyle, and hallowed him to king on midwinter day. In this king's time was all dissension, and evil, and rapine, for against him rose soon the rich men who were traitors, and first of all Baldwin de Redvers, who held Exeter against him. But the king beset it, and afterwards Baldwin accorded. Then took the others, and held their castles against him, and David, king of Scotland, took to Wessington against him. Nevertheless, their messengers passed between them, and they came together, and were settled, but it availed little. A.D. 1137 This year went the King Stephen over sea to Normandy, and there was received, for that they concluded that he should be all such as the uncle was, and because he had got his treasure, but he dealed it out, and scattered it foolishly. Much had King Henry gathered, gold and silver, but no good did men for his soul thereof. When the King Stephen came to England, he held his council at Oxford, where he seized the Bishop Roger of Sarum, and Alexander, Bishop of Lincoln, and the Chancellor Roger, his nephew, and threw all into prison till they gave up their castles. When the traitors understood that he was a mild man, and soft, and good, and no justice executed, then did they all wonder. They had done him homage, and sworn oaths, but they no truth maintained. 
they were all forsworn and forgetful of their troth, for every rich man built his castles, which they held against him, and they filled the land full of castles. They cruelly oppressed the wretched men of the land with castle works, and when the castles were made, they filled them with devils and evil men. Then took they those whom they supposed to have any goods, both by night and by day, laboring men and women, and threw them into prison for their gold and silver, and inflicted on them unutterable tortures, for never were any martyrs so tortured as they were. Some they hanged up by the feet, and smoked them with foul smoke, and some by the thumbs, or by the head, and hung coats of mail on their feet. They tied knotted strings about their heads, and twisted them till the pain went to the brains. They put them into dungeons, wherein were adders, and snakes, and toads, and so destroyed them. Some they placed in a cursed house, that is, in a chest that was short and narrow, and not deep, wherein they put sharp stones, and so thrust the man therein, that they broke all the limbs. In many of the castles were things loathsome and grim, called sachentiges, of which two or three men had enough to bear one. It was thus made, that is, fastened to a beam, and they placed a sharp iron, collar, about the man's throat and neck, so that he could in no direction either sit, or lie, or sleep, but bear all that iron. Many thousands they wore out with hunger. I neither can, nor may I tell all the wounds and all the pains which they inflicted on wretched men in this land. This lasted the nineteen winters, while Stephen was king, and it grew continually worse and worse. They constantly laid guilds on the towns, and called it ten Siri, and when the wretched men had no more to give, then they plundered and burned all the towns, that well thou mightest go a whole day's journey and never shouldest thou find a man sitting in a town, nor the land tilled. Then was corn deer, and flesh, and cheese, and butter, for none was there in the land. Wretched men starved of hunger. Some had recourse to alms, who were for a while rich men, and some fled out of the land. Never yet was there more wretchedness in the land, nor ever did heathen men worse than they did, for, after a time, they spared neither church nor churchyard, but took all the goods that were therein, and then burned the church and all together. Neither did they spare a bishop's land, or an abbot's, or a priest's, but plundered both monks and clerks, and every man robbed another who could. If two men, or three, came riding to a town, all the township fled for them, concluding them to be robbers. The bishops and learned men cursed them continually, but the effect thereof was nothing to them, for they were all accursed, and forsworn, and abandoned. To till the ground was to plough the sea, the earth bare no corn, for the land was all laid waste by such deeds, and they said openly, that Christ slept, and his saints. Such things, and more than we can say, suffered we nineteen winters for our sins. In all this evil time held Abbot Martin his abbacy twenty years and a half, and eight days, with much tribulation, and found the monks and the guests everything that behoved them, and held much charity in the house, and, notwithstanding all this, wrought on the church, and set their two lands in rents, and enriched it very much, and bestowed vestments upon it. And he brought them into the new minster on St. Peter's Mass Day with much pomp, which was in the year, from the incarnation of our Lord, 1140, and in the twenty-third from the destruction of the place by fire. And he went to Rome, and there was well received by the Pope Eugenius, from whom he obtained their privileges, one for all the lands of the abbey, and another for the lands that adjoined to the churchyard, and, if he might have lived longer, so he meant to do concerning the treasury. And he got in the lands that rich men retained by main strength. Of William Malduit, who held the castle of Rockingham, he won Coatingham and Easton, and of Hugh de Walteville, he won Hertlingbury and Stanwick, and sixty shillings from Old Winkle each year. And he made many monks, and planted a vineyard, and constructed many works, and made the town better than it was before. He was a good monk, and a good man, and for this reason God and good men loved him. Now we will relate in part what happened in King Stephen's time. In his reign the Jews of Norwich bought a Christian child before Easter, and tortured him after the same manner as our Lord was tortured, and on Long Friday hanged him on a rood, in mockery of our Lord, and afterwards buried him. They supposed that it would be concealed, but our Lord showed that he was a holy martyr. And the monks took him, and buried him with high honor in the minster. And through our Lord he worketh wonderful and manifold miracles, and is called Street William. A.D. 1138 In this year came David, king of Scotland, with an immense army to this land. 
he was ambitious to win this land, but against him came William, Earl of Albemarle, to whom the king had committed York and other borderers, with few men, and fought against them, and routed the king at the standard, and slew very many of his gang. A.D. 1140 in this year wished the King Stephen to take Robert, Earl of Gloucester, the son of King Henry, but he could not, for he was aware of it. After this, in the Lent, the sun and the day darkened about the noontide of the day, when men were eating, and they lighted candles to eat by. That was the thirteenth day before the calends of April. Men were very much struck with wonder. Thereafter died William, Archbishop of Canterbury, and the King made Theobald Archbishop, who was Abbot of Beck. After this waxed a very great war betwixt the king and Randolph, Earl of Chester, not because he did not give him all that he could ask him, as he did to all others, but ever the more he gave them, the worse they were to him. The earl held Lincoln against the king, and took away from him all that he ought to have. And the king went thither, and beset him and his brother William de Romari in the castle. And the earl stole out, and went after Robert, Earl of Gloucester, and brought him thither with a large army. And they fought strenuously on Candlemas Day against their lord, and took him, for his men forsook him and fled. And they led him to Bristol, and there put him into prison in close quarters. Then was all England stirred more than air was, and all evil was in the land. Afterwards came the daughter of King Henry, who had been Empress of Germany, and now was Countess of Anjou. She came to London, but the people of London attempted to take her, and she fled, losing many of her followers. After this the Bishop of Winchester, Henry, the brother of King Stephen, spake with Earl Robert, and with the Empress, and swore them oaths, that he never more would hold with the King, his brother, and cursed all the men that held with him, and told them, that he would give them up Winchester, and he caused them to come thither. When they were therein, then came the King's Queen with all her strength, and beset them, so that there was great hunger therein. When they could no longer hold out, then stole they out, and fled, but those without were aware, and followed them, and took Robert, Earl of Gloucester, and led him to Rochester, and put him there into prison, but the Empress fled into a monastery. Then went the wise men between the king's friends and the earl's friends, and settled so that they should let the king out of prison for the earl, and the earl for the king, and so they did. After this settled the king and Earl Randolph at Stamford, and swore oaths, and plighted their troth, that neither should betray the other. But it availed nothing. For the king afterwards took him at Northampton, through wicked counsel, and put him into prison, and soon after he let him out again, through worse counsel, on the condition that he swore by the crucifix, and found hostages, that he would give up all his castles. Some he gave up, and some gave he not up, and did then worse than he otherwise would. Then was England very much divided. Some held with the king, and some with the empress, for when the king was in prison, the earls and the rich men supposed that he never more would come out, and they settled with the empress, and brought her into Oxford, and gave her the borough. When the king was out, he heard of this, and took his force, and beset her in the tower. And they let her down in the night from the tower by ropes. And she stole out, and fled, and went on foot to Wallingford. Afterward she went over sea, and those of Normandy turned all from the king to the Earl of Anjou, some willingly, and some against their will, for he beset them till they gave up their castles, and they had no help of the king. Then went Eustace, the king's son, to France, and took to wife the sister of the king of France. He thought to obtain Normandy thereby, but he sped little, and by good right, for he was an evil man. Wherever he was, he did more evil than good, he robbed the lands, and levied heavy guilds upon them. He brought his wife to England, and put her into the castle at. Good woman she was, but she had little bliss with him, and Christ would not that he should long reign. He therefore soon died, and his mother also. And the Earl of Anjou died, and his son Henry took to the earldom. And the Queen of France parted from the king, and she came to the young Earl Henry, and he took her to wife, and all Poitou with her. Then went he with a large force into England, and won some castles, and the king went against him with a much larger force. Nevertheless, fought they not, but the archbishop and the wise men went between them, and made this settlement, that the king should be lord and king while he lived, and after his day Henry should be king, that Henry should take him for a father, and he him for a son, that peace and union should be betwixt them and in all England. This and the other provisions that they made, swore the king and the earl to observe, and all the bishops, and the earls, and the rich men.
Then was the Earl received at Winchester, and at London, with great worship, and all did him homage, and swore to keep the peace. And there was soon so good a peace as never was there before. Then was the king stronger than he ever was before. And the Earl went over sea, and all people loved him, for he did good justice, and made peace. A.D. 1154 In this year died the King Stephen, and he was buried where his wife and his son were buried, at Faversham, which monastery they founded. When the king died, then was the earl beyond sea, but no man durst do other than good for the great fear of him. When he came to England, then was he received with great worship, and blessed a king in London on the Sunday before midwinter day. And there held he a full court. The same day that Martin, abbot of Peterborough, should have gone thither, then sickened he, and died on the fourth day before the nones of January, and the monks, within the day, chose another of themselves, whose name was William de Walteville, a good clerk, and good man, and well beloved of the king, and of all good men. And all the monks buried the abbot with high honours. And soon the newly chosen abbot, and the monks with him, went to Oxford to the king. And the king gave him the abbacy, and he proceeded soon afterwards to Peterborough, where he remained with the abbot, ere he came home. And the king was received with great worship at Peterborough, in full procession. And so he was also at Ramsey, and at Thorny, and at. And at Spalding, and at.